Good morning. Okay, the time is 9 a.m. and I'm going to call the uh, council meeting for October 3rd, 2022 at 9 a.m. Uh, open and We'll do a land acknowledgement that the City of Fort Saskatchewan is located within Treaty 6 territory and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Nihuac, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, Nakota Sioux, and Métis. We acknowledge the many First Nations Métis and Inuit peoples whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. It is because of our treaty relationship that we can live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory. And thank you. So there are no delegations that have registered for today. Uh, Councillor Blizzard will be joining us virtually. She is joining us virtually. I can see her on WebEx. Hello. And uh, today is for the purpose of doing capital budget planning. And uh, we do have, I'm going to um, we will have breaks, but because we have to be under the um, Highway 15 bridge for 2 o'clock, we're going to try and do lunch at about 11.30, and we'll only take 30 minutes. Then we'll come back for about an hour and a half, and these are going to be really tight time time frames. We'll come back for about an hour and a half, and then after that we will um, hopefully carpool over to what apparently is the bridge opening. That's my understanding. And uh, then we will play out the rest of the day after that and see how it goes. Okay, so with that, um, welcome Troy Fleming, City Manager, uh, to do an introduction of the 2023 uh, capital budget. Thank you, Worship. This is um, every year throughout the course of the term, I, I sort of make it a little bit shorter because Council has, uh, has heard a lot of it before. I really just want to give um, sort of some some summed up thoughts of of the months of work that we've put into this, and really just to give council a few um, places with which we want to make sure you uh, pay specific attention. So, welcome to council. Welcome to all the staff and everyone else that's uh, listening um, in on this. We're very pleased with the work, and and uh, we hope that it meets council's needs. Um, I do, as always, want to really thank the staff team, um, uh, especially with uh, Ms. Andruco and uh, all of this, the staff within finance and then all of the other departments who have been working on a lot of this since uh, pretty much the last budget starting in January and February. So uh, a lot of work goes into it and, and uh, we're very proud of the document. As always, just a reminder that Council is responsible for approving three distinct pieces of the budget. Um, uh, the operating budget will come in mid-November. Um, so this particular part of the budget really looks at current year capital and then the 10-year uh, capital plan. Um, I think the intent with what we're going to do is that today would be to hear presentations, to introduce items, and uh, then on Thursday, we could actually come back and have uh, any kind of debate um, on, the, uh, on the items themselves. So some high-level considerations. Just want to point out to Council that the interest rate changes that have been made by the provincial government have had a financial impact on the 10-year capital plan specifically or any projects that um, were proposed to be debenture funded. Um, so do make sure you take a look at that, specifically with the, the property tax impact of any debenture-funded projects. Uh, the 10-year capital plan has a fairly increased level of intensification over the next five years, so do make sure you take a look at the next five-year period, um, not just in terms of each individual project, but do try to take a look at sort of the overall big picture of it. Um, with increased capital spending and increased activity, uh, that does mean we have an increased risk of um, our inflation risk um, on many of our projects. Really, that could be where you go into a project with a certain cost estimate and perhaps your tenders come back higher than you think or through the duration of the project or unexpected costs or increased costs. So um, it's just something for us to keep in the back of our mind. 
And like I said, uh, make sure you take a look at projects individually and then try to look at the big picture, especially those sum totals at the bottom of the 10-year capital plan. Um, so you can understand what it looks like from year to year. I would describe the 2023 capital budget as being fairly straightforward. There isn't a lot in there that you would describe as a discretionary type of project. Um, primarily the costs are our are, are annual ongoing programs, uh, you know, your neighborhood rehabs and your road rehabs and whatnot. Um, I do want to point out, I didn't put a note on my slide here, but um, we had been working for I don't know how many years to remove the MSI funding from our neighborhood rehab program. And that has been done now, um, which is great for us. That means with what we've got in the capital budget, we have a fully funded, fully taxpayer funded neighborhood rehab program. Whether or not we're funding it to the right amount is something we're looking into. Um, but I think that's, you know, a bit of a, a good accomplishment for us and something that we've been working on for, I, I want to guess around six or seven years, but um, that's a nice little kind of budgetary accomplishment for the city and good for our sustainability. Um, so again, with respect to key projects, um, the GRC revitalization um, phase one of that was approved uh, previously um, the phase two approval is not part of this capital budget, but we do expect that to be coming back to council in early 2023 if there's a desire to continue on with that work um, when we get our phase two or class two uh, cost estimates. Um, phase one of the Veterans Way corridor is obviously something that's been moved. Um, I believe it was last year that that one was the timing of that one was changed and uh, council may want to change the timing of that again. So we just want to highlight that. Um, there is a phase one being proposed for 2023 and phase one of Fort Center Park is also within this project and the timing of when we're bringing this back was specifically um, uh, noted by the, the previous council. Um, we did not make significant changes to the 10-year capital plan other than um, we did reinsert the highway corridor um, with new phasing. So I think we have phase one coming next year and then phase two and three would be proposed to come after the Dow expansion. The Dow expansion has really been driving the conversation around um, the highway uh, or Veterans Way corridor expansion. And there will be significant discussion over several capital budget projects within the next year. And what I mean by that is if you can, if you kind of step back and look at the 10 year capital plan and some of the work we have going, we have ongoing and some of the requirements that we have in the revised um, uh, capital and operating budget policy, um, just to summarize, um, we heard about the fire services master plan at the last council meeting. We've got a functional planning study ongoing for secondary water source. Um, we've got a detailed study ongoing for recreation facilities. Um, we've got a study underway for materials handling in a snow dump site. There's a detailed study for neighborhood rehab. And um, we've got, we continue the ongoing work of the technical studies for the annexation lands. So those are six examples of where we're, con we're going out and getting additional information for council's consideration. Um, and when, those, when that, these bodies of work come back, that may inform changes to the 10-year capital plan or uh, the current year capital plan. And again, a lot of these are to meet, meet the enhanced requirements in the um, capital and operating budget policy. Um, Again, um, if you look at the 10-year capital plan, specifically from 2024 to 2028, three major projects you would see kind of bundled up in fairly close proximity to one another. There was a second fire hall, um, the recreation slash aquatics facility, and the secondary water source. And the three of those together, um, like I said, cr uh, contribute to that intensification over the next five years. And that's really where you have to start looking at things like your deck capacity, how close are we coming to our overall um, deck capacity in terms of our policy limits. 
And lastly, as always, capital budgets come with inflationary risks and the supply chain risks, which contribute to both the inflationary component and to our ability to meet um, project timelines. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll welcome Mr. Eamon up to the microphone, and then I can take questions when he's, uh, when he's done. Okay, thank you very much. And Mr. Eamon is going to give us the overview on the process. Yes, you can keep coming. Um, but just before he begins, once we get into this, uh, typically during the capital budget, uh, we go back to a rotation. So unless there's any objection to that, um, we'll go back and use the two questions and then rotate around. So I'm not seeing any objection to that, so that's good. And Mr. Eamon, welcome, and you can talk about process as well. Good morning, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Jeremy Eamon, the City's Chief Financial Officer, and it's my pleasure also to welcome everyone to day one of the 2023 Capital Budget Meetings. Joining me is Ms. Andruko, Manager, Budget and Financial Planning. And as mentioned by Mr. Fleming, there are two days of meetings planned for Council's review and deliberation of the 2023 Capital Budget and 10-year Capital Plan. Day one, October 3rd, today, is for presentations, and day two, October 6th, is for Council deliberations. Before we begin, I'd just like to do a quick review of the process that we'll be following. Administration will be making two presentations to Council, starting with a presentation of the proposed 2023 Capital Budget, followed by a presentation of the proposed 2023-2032 Capital Plan. In the event that we are unable to complete both presentations in the time allotted for today, we will resume the presentations at the start of day two. Council is advised to follow the flagged items process, which allows Council to hear presentations of the entire capital budget and 10-year capital plan on day one, as well as receive any supplementary information prior to deliberation on day two. The process also allows other members of Council to be aware of the flagged items and or potential motions that may come forward on day two and administration the time to prepare further information as necessary. If a Council member wishes to flag an item for later discussion, the Mayor will determine if there is unanimous consent. If unanimous consent is given, then the item will be considered flagged. If not unanimous, or if a vote is requested by a member, any council member, a vote will be held, and if the item receives a majority of votes, then the item will be considered flagged. Council members wishing to put forward a motion on day one that is not specific to a presented or flagged item should give notice of motion, which would then be addressed on day two. Also, council may ask administration clarifying questions during and at the conclusion of each presentation. If the question cannot be readily answered by administration, or if it requires a considerable amount of work, the city manager will advise council of options for when the information will be made available. The directors responsible for capital projects are available to answer questions as they arise. As for the order of today's presentations, I'll begin with an overview of the proposed 2023 capital budget. Following this, I'll present the annual capital programs for council's review and consideration. Next, capital budget requests for new capital projects will be presented by the responsible director. And directors responsible uh, include Mr. Schaefer, Director of Fleet Facilities and Engineering, Mr. Gagnon, Director of Public Works, Mr. Martins, the City's Fire Chief, and Mr. Harder, Director of Information Technology. Once the capital budget presentations and questions have concluded, I will then present an overview of the 10-year capital plan and similarly, Council will have the opportunity to ask clarifying questions and or flag items specific to the 10-year capital plan. Council's formal approval of the 2023 capital budget is scheduled for December 13th, along with approval of the 2023 operating budget. And with respect to the 10-year capital plan, Council will perform an initial review of the plan during these meetings and another review in June of next year prior <coughs> to adoption. Just a quick reminder of the various sections within the 2023 capital budget document. Section one includes the 2023 capital budget in brief, annual capital programs and breakdowns of the capital budget by asset categories and by funding sources. Section two includes the proposed 2023 capital budget requests and section three includes information on the 10 year capital plan. The budget document also includes links to relevant financial policies priority-based budgeting, and other information. 
So just some background, the city is committed to careful long-term planning and budgeting of its capital assets to meet the needs of a growing community while responsibly managing its finances. Infrastructure and equipment are essential for providing services which are critical to the everyday lives of citizens. Services such as safe roads, clean drinking water, fire protection and municipal enforcement would not be possible without capital assets that function properly and are well maintained. The city's capital plan is developed in accordance with the city's operating and capital budgets policy, FIN 24-C, and complies with the requirements of the Municipal Government Act. The city's capital plan consists of two components, the proposed 2023 capital budget and the proposed 10-year capital plan. The capital budget establishes the city's capital requirements over the next 12 months. Its primary focus is to support critical infrastructure and equipment over the short term in order to maintain service levels. The 10-year capital plan, on the other hand, assesses the city's capital requirements over a much longer time horizon. It responds to the future needs of the community and addresses the maintenance and replacement of aging assets into the future. The city uses priority-based budgeting as a leading best practice for local governments to help prioritize spending. PVB provides the tools and framework for prioritizing and evaluating options for both capital projects and operating programs to help inform resource allocation decisions. Capital projects within the 2023 capital budget and the 10-year capital plan have been prioritized using PVB tools. This involved a process of scoring each item against the city's established community and governance results and basic program attributes. Results were drawn from the city's strategic documents, including the most recent strategic plan and its newest goal of environmental stewardship and climate change readiness, along with the municipal development plan and others, which help to define what the city government is in business to achieve. Basic program attributes are more general to the PBB model and are common to municipalities. More information on results and attributes is available within the budget document. Capital projects were each assigned a final score using a quartile system. Quartiles are based on a sliding scale ranging from Q1 and Q2 projects, which align most closely with the city's priorities and desired results, down to Q3 and Q4, projects which align the least. More information on PBB scoring can be found within program reports for each capital budget request, as well as ranked listings for the 2023 capital budget on page 1-3 and for the 10-year capital plan on page 3-7. It's important to note that data and analysis provided by PBB scoring are helpful for decision making, but other factors such as specific needs, constraints, and grant eligibility must also be considered. The proposed 2023 capital budget includes total spending of approximately $26.9 million. By way of comparison, the 2022 approved capital budget totaled $14 million. Four major asset categories are represented. Engineering structures related to city projects represents the largest category at $16.7 million, or just over 60% of total planned spending. Significant projects include local road and neighborhood rehabilitation, totaling $7.1 million and $8.5 million for the Veterans Way corridor widening and north pedestrian crossing projects. Approximately $2.5 million is planned to be spent on the replacement of vehicles, machinery and equipment. Buildings total approximately $5.9 million. And this category includes one project, that is the Jubilee Recreation Center modernization. And this particular project that Mr. Fleming mentioned is included in the 2023 capital budget and will be coming back to council in early 2023 for phase two budget approval will be prior to construction. And finally, land improvements include 1.7 million for the Fort Center Park phase one project and the new columbarium. For a detailed listing of the proposed 2023 capital projects by asset category, along with the operating impacts for 2023 and 2024, refer to page 1-16 in the capital budget document. The proposed 2023 capital budget is funded from a variety of sources. The majority of capital funding will come from municipal reserves at 10.7 million or approximately 40% of total funding. Proposed drawdowns from reserves include 5.9 million from the future facility operating reserve, 2.8 million from the utilities infrastructure reserve, 1.9 million from various equipment life cycle reserves, and 0.1 million from the perpetual care reserve. Grant funding of 7.6 million, or 28% of total funding, 
includes 3.9 million from the Municipal Sustainability Initiative, or MSI, and 3.7 million from the Canada Community Building Fund, which is formerly the Gas Tax Fund, Federal Gas Tax Fund. Grants are generally preferred over other municipal funding sources, given their reduced impact on taxpayers. The city optimizes the use of grants annually to ensure they're being fully utilized and comply with all provincial and or federal requirements. The proposed 2023 capital budget includes debenture funding of approximately $5 million for the Veterans Way Corridor Widening Project. Annual capital funding of $3.1 million represents approved ongoing allocations from operations which are used to fund annual capital programs and small-scale projects that do not qualify for capital grants. Funding is provided by municipal taxes, user fees, fines, etc. And finally, trade in values and proceeds on disposal account for approximately 480000 For more information on each of these capital funding sources, refer to Section 1, pages 4 through 7 in the capital budget document, and also a detailed listing of capital projects by funding source can be found on page 1-17. And that concludes my overview of the proposed 2023 capital budget. Next, the annual capital programs and capital budget requests will be presented. The proposed 2023 capital budget includes seven annual capital programs and 10 capital budget requests. Annual capital programs represent the life cycle replacement of aging infrastructure and equipment that is required to meet today's standards, maintain asset quality, and ensure proper function. Capital budget requests represent the new infrastructure and technology and equipment that is needed for service delivery. We'll begin with the annual capital programs for Council's review and consideration. Detailed information on each of these programs can be found in Section 1, pages 8 through 15 in the capital budget document. And just as a reminder, Council is free to ask clarifying questions at the end of each presentation slide, and the directors responsible for these capital projects are here to assist. Starting with Project 19006, Culture Equipment Lifecycle Replacement for 50900 this project sees the life cycle replacement of the Shell Theater's specialized video system and projector to be funded from the Culture Equipment and Exhibits Reserve. The current system and projector was purchased in 2012 and has effectively reached the end of its life cycle. Video technology has changed significantly since the original equipment was acquired, including increased demand for video streaming and online integration. Taking advantage of the latest technology will ensure the theater continues to offer the best event experience possible. Project 19007, local road rehab for 2.75 million. This is an ongoing annual program that maintains the city's roadways to ensure safety and proper functioning as part of the annual pavement management program. The program is funded by 1.5 million from the Canada Community Building Fund 0.9 million from MSI and 274,000 from annual capital funding. And starting in 2023, the city will move to replace MSI capital grant funding with annual capital funding in order to reduce reliance on MSI capital grants for these types of ongoing annual maintenance programs. Project 19008, Neighborhood Rehabilitation for 4.3 million. This is another ongoing annual program that maintains neighborhood infrastructure such as sidewalks, water lines, and sewer lines to meet current standards and to ensure proper function. The program is funded by 2.8 million from the Utilities Infrastructure Reserve and 1.5 million from annual capital funding. Project 19012, Information Technology Network Infrastructure for 156,000. The city's Information Technology Network Infrastructure is the collection of physical and virtual resources that support the flow and processing of information. Timely replacement of critical networking com components safeguards the city's digital information from cyber threats and ensures proper function. IT network infrastructure proposed for replacement in 2023 include two core switches at the James E. Graham building, two network firewalls at City Hall, and replacement of the on-site network backup. These replacements will support IT security and data management across the organization and provide stability and data transfer speeds. The project is to be wholly funded from the IT Equipment Reserve. 
So at this point, I will pause to ask council if they have any questions regarding these four items. Okay, thank you very much. So just remember if there's, uh, I'm going to go through the rotation and I've still got my sheets from when we were on Zoom, so we'll just keep the same rotation list. Uh, if there becomes any items that you want flagged, we will have to see if there is consensus and if not, uh, then we would go to a vote. So um, I'll start at the top of my list. Councillor Macon, do you have any questions? No? You're good? Pardon? Go ahead. And everybody, try and keep it to two questions. I can go around a second time if anybody needs it. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> um, I don't actually really have a specific question to these requests, but I'm just curious of how long it took to get the MSI Reliance out of the Neighborhood Rehab Program. How many years were we doing that? It was a five-year program. Thank you. That's my only question right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't have any questions on these ones. Councillor Harris, do you have questions? I can't. <laughs> this is going to sound really bad. I, I don't have the ability to turn your computer on. Go okay, ahead. So push the button. <laughs> uh, with respect to uh, Project 19006, um, I haven't been in the um, <clears throat> Shell Theater in a long time. And uh, we had the presentation on Sunday night, no, Friday night. The quality that was presented with that projector, how much will it get better with new equipment over what we saw in the imagery that was coming up on the screen? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Harrison, uh, so there'll be a variety of things that'll be looked at as we get the new projector. Ultimately, it'll depend what we buy. So we'll look at the amount of light that's thrown off will typically increase with a newer uh, piece of equipment, which will have a substantial uh, impact on how visible it is and some of the color quality. We'll also look at things like the contrast. So how well, for example, with your own TV, the blacks and the different colors give contrast to each other, which will help sharpen the image. So I would say without having the actual projector in front of us, you could make um, equate it to looking at buying a new TV for, versus one from six or seven years ago. We might not look at the resolution of 4K. We're debating that based on the need. But in general, you should see, quite frankly, a visual difference in terms of the quality based on um, how much the standards have increased over the last decade. And the, ultimately, the other piece, uh, if you've ever gone into a store, is the pace on, depends on the input. So what is the quality of the actual video being shown? So for example, on Friday night, it was a, uh, a smaller, uh, the name eludes me, documentary, as opposed to a, a big post-production piece. So even the input of the quality of the video will have an impact, but it should be noticeable in most cases using a standard uh, common video. Yeah, I think I, I was looking for more of a subjective response. You know, like we look at that, would there be a 10, 15, 20% increase based on industry standards with the technology that we'll likely get? And you said there's a number of technologies we can look at, and you guys will go through that evaluative process. That, yeah, that's more detail than I was looking for. It's just, is it a, a noticeable improvement is really ultimately what comes with the uh, acquisition of new equipment. Yeah, I would suggest that. But I would also say, suggest the biggest issue with this is we want to ensure that equipment doesn't fail us going forward uh, because it has reached the end of its lifespan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That answer. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Blizzard, do you have questions? Yes, I do. Um, first of all, the local road rehabilitation, and can you hear me okay? Can hear you fine. Okay. Um, the local road rehabilitation, I found going through there, it really doesn't give specifics. So I'm assuming that you know, roads are assessed yearly, and then we have a list of what they do, or is there a progression of roads, you know, a regular rotation? Mr. Schaefer? Um, your Worship the Councillor Blizzard. So for this project, it, it comes down to timing in terms of when we can 
get produce a map. Um, generally, we get that information through the fall um, where we can say where we're going to be next or what roads need to be done next. And we reevaluate again in the spring, make sure nothing new has popped up. Um, so it's, it's tough to say exactly where we're going to be. Um, at this time of year, we have a, a program that goes through, um, evaluates the roads, maintains um, a certain uh, pavement quality index. We, we use 6.5 as, as an industry standard, um, looking at a number of things. So it's, uh, we don't want to put a map out right now to say that this is what it's going to be because it's likely going to change as we get through winter. Um, and it just changes the expectations. Okay, thanks. Um, I also, uh, because it looks very, I mean, it's a big expense, um, but it doesn't really specify. So what was spent so far this year? What do we expect to spend by the end of the year? And so they're all tied together. So I hope this is okay. And what do we do if there's extra that was unspent? Um, so your worship to Council Blizzard. So this year, um, I think the budget was approximately 2.7 million. Um, it grows a little bit with inflation every year. Um, we've physically spent, I think, about 2.4 to date, and that's completed the program for this year. Um, we did put off one section of roadway um, just because of timing um, with schools and things like that to, to make sure we weren't interrupting traffic too much. Um, we're going to roll that into next year's program. Any money we don't spend in the current year rolls forward into the next year, so um, the, the surplus this year would be applied into next year's program. So at some point that surplus, it must go back into a fund or does that just mean then with this 2.7 million, you'll have 3 million next year? Uh, your respective council wizard, that's correct. It'll be 3 million next year is what we'd be spending. Okay. okay. So I'm thank going you. To... Um, that's it for now, but I'll, I, I'll have more. Gail. You want yeah. me to come back to you after? On these ones? Yep. Okay. Uh, yes, I have another. Yep. I have. Okay. Councillor Noyan. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I just have a follow-up <clears throat> question regarding MSI and, and neighbourhood rehabilitation. It says verbatim in the uh, the budget report the proposed 23 capital budget includes 3.9 million of MSI <clears throat> with 30 uh, or 935k devoted to ongoing neighbourhood rehabilitation. I thought that was taken out uh, of funding for this year and that's that's contrary to what we're saying right now uh through your worship the what we're saying when we say we're taking the msi out it means we're replacing the msi funding that used to go towards neighborhood rehab and we're going to use tax taxpayer funding instead so okay. the expression take it out means we had been using MSI in the past, and we're, we're not going to do that anymore going into the future. Okay, great. And, and then just briefly, why is it important to do so? Uh, yeah, through your worship, it just we, in terms of the city's long-term sustainability, we need to know that we have the money being budgeted, consistent funding, and our most consistent tax uh, or our most consistent revenue source is taxpayer funding. Um, so we want to make sure our most important programs are funded with our most consistent source of revenue. Yeah, understandable, given the 25% uh, decrease in, in uh, that fund this year. And can I ask another question, or was that too? That's your That's too. Okay, I'll come I'll back, come back around. Okay, Councillor Abatoye, questions? Go ahead. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I have quite a few questions, so I apologize in advance. Um, just two quick high-level finance questions. Um, so on page 1-6, we talk about um, MSI capital grant and the CCBF. Um, you have an un uncommitted balance there. Is that of 1.5 and I think 2.25 in the other one? So is that funds from the previous year? And... Um, are we expected to, um, to are we ex required to return funds after some time if they're not utilized? What are the on, um, open uncommitted balances I see here? Uh, through your worship, Duke Councillor Avatoya. Um, so the opening uncommitted balance for both of them is basically the balance unused brought forward from the previous year. Right. And so that's uncommitted. So that can be um, allocated by council to various projects with, during that year. So Con sorry. God, is, is there a requirement, though, to return the money after if it's not used at some time? Uh, through your worship, Duke Councillor Abitoya, um, 
the government and federal, provincial and federal governments do monitor that. They're, they they do allow some latitude with municipalities to spend the funding. Um, the key thing is to have a plan for it, and so we do have to do annual reporting to make sure that we have plans for those funds. But. Okay. Thank you. Um, my second question is around reserves. Like we take some money out, um, I think, um, from our operating um, budgets towards reserves. And I, I believe we use the value of whatever the equipment is as at today. And so say, for example, in 10 years, um, we have 50,000, just an example. And that equipment doesn't cost 50,000 in 10 years. So how do we account for inflation? Like, do we get the balance, the difference from um, reserves or does it go, does it, do we get the money from the annual capital funding? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Abitoya. So I believe the process is that we take into account inflation when we determine the operating transfer each year to ensure that we're both in terms of timing it correctly when that asset uh, requires replacement, but also that it, it's as close as possible to our best estimate of what the replacement cost will be. So with those annual operating uh, transfers, we do do account for inflation component okay. on those. Okay, so for some reason I thought you have to, there's an accounting standard that, that's in, that says you have to use the value as at today and not a futuristic value. through your worship to councillor abitoya so that would be the cost in the financial statements so on the city's balance sheet for sure we have to record it at cost right. but when we're planning for reserves okay. particularly down in the future we can that it, there's some latitude there we can okay. follow okay. replacement costs perfect. for that thank you please come back yep i'll go back around councillor making anything further on this one these ones no you're good uh councillor harris anything further no you're good Councillor Blizzard, you had indicated you had a couple more on these ones. Just one more question. Yes. Um, so on uh, the neighborhood rehabilitation, which is 104th Street between 99 and 100 Ave, um, to, looking at that, that's we're going right by the Lions uh, Pool. Um, are we going to have some kind of access? I'd hate to see it closed. We've had enough issues with COVID and kids not being able to access it. Our summers are getting hotter. Mr. Schaefer? Uh, yeah, your, your worship to uh, to Council Blizzard. We are working with a contractor to figure out that that plan. Um, they know that the Lions Pool will be operating and to maintain access to that at all times. So it'll be worked out through the through the construction planning. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Noyan, anything further? Yeah, just a couple more questions. So going back to funding, uh, the roadway rehabilitation with the CCBF. Um, so in the perspective of, of the, the federal grant that, or the, the grantor, uh, is, does this reflect negatively on us if, if we choose not to go through with some of these projects, in your opinion? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, um, I, I think it's I think it's always okay for municipalities to defer, uh, like to plans change, and so there is latitude to defer a project to be spent in a future year. But again, you don't want to keep deferring. Um, there, like I said be in my previous answer, was that there's always need to be a plan for for spending the and use of those funds. Um, I think that the um, both federal and provincial grants, there is annual reporting that is required, so they do um, keep us on our toes, so to speak, with, with the status of those plans. So we do have to have um, plans to spend the funds. But again, there's, there is latitude for those funds to carry over from one year to the next. Right, yeah. So if we keep deferring the same project, it's probably going to raise some questions on, on, on their part. That would be correct. Yeah, that would be my opinion. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I would think so as well. Um, and then my my other question has to do with the operating impacts of both um, 1907 and 1908. In in the report, it says the operating impacts 124,000 in 2023 for for local road rehabilitation, and then I think around yeah 276 in 2023 for neighborhood re rehabilitation. These are increased operating expenses from these two capital projects, wouldn't we see a decrease in, in operating expenditures when we're doing improvements to roadways? Mr. Schaefer or Ms. Andruco? These operating impacts are to deal with um, coming off the reliance of MSI. So actually we're increasing our tax 
um, increase our tax revenue to fund these programs instead of MSI. Okay, I see. That, 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 that's exactly what I wanted to hear. Okay, thank you. Okay. Councillor Evatoye, a couple more questions. Okay, um, the culture culture equipment life cycle replacement, um, it says you have a 10-year ten, um, ten life cycle on there. Why do we not have an operating impact for 2024 to start to build up the reserves for that? We already have an uh, operating impact included, um, so we'll continue with it. We'll revisit. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at your um, the assets categories on page 1-16. That's from prior year um, purchases. So um, if we purchased uh, something from last year, um, the transfer to reserve um, happens in the following year. So right. So as I'm saying, for 2024, though, there isn't an, an operating impact. And when I look at the other others, so they have one. For the 2023 project, there is no need to increase our transfer to reserve. Right. So projects. my question is about 24. Yeah. So in 2024... Um, there is no need to increase our our operating impact for this purchase in 2023. Um, we currently have the money. Should should um, a different replacement happen or we go over a little bit or under, we'll revise those numbers. Um, but at this point, we don't anticipate any changes. So there should be no operating impact extra. So, so help me understand. So when we purchase an equipment, when do we start to put money into reserves to be able to replace it um, at the end of the life cycle? The first time we purchase it. So if it's brand new, um, for example, like for, um, let's say, vehicle. We've never had a certain type of vehicle. We have five trucks. Now we want six. So that sixth truck. That sixth truck, when we purchase it, will add all the operating impacts, the, the insurance, the gas, the maintenance, and the transfer to reserve. That stays. So that just continues and continues and continues. Um, for the purchase of the next okay. time, we don't need to increase insurance or gas. Okay, so I get it. It's very similar. Okay, so this is just, it's a, okay, I get it. Okay, got it. So if it was a new equipment, then we would have that. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, so local road rehabilitation, um, just looking at the PQI at 6.5, I can bet that this PQI was like 7.5 a few years ago, so, um, or 7. So was, is like the industry standards dropping or, or what's happening there? Um, Your Worship Councilor Vitoye, so the, the program is set up, and I, I think it has always been set up at 6.5. Um, I'm pretty sure in the previous council, yeah, I'm pretty it sure it's like answer to the question, um, please. It, it could be, and, and we, when we do our evaluation, that we do get an annual evaluation that shows where we're at. Um, and typically, we're one or two points above kind of our, our goal. So if we're aiming for 6.5, we'll be between 6.5 and 7. Um, we don't want to go too far ahead because then you're spending money you don't need to yet, and you don't want to go too low because then you... Oh, so there's a up. range, right? There is a bit of a okay. range, but okay. 6.5 is kind of where we're aiming for. Okay, got it. Okay, and my final question, if nobody else has any questions... Councillor Harris does, but if it's your okay, final... sure, you can come back to me. No, no, go ahead. No, I thought it was two questions. Yeah, it is. I, that's why I checked. I asked two questions already, so... Okay, this so I'm going to go to Councillor Harris and... As everybody else has said they're done, go ahead, Councillor Harris. Um, can you refresh my memory as to where we capitalize purchases? Is it 10000 50000 whatever? Obviously three, not fifty because we got something in the budget for that amount. Three worship to Councillor Harris. Um, the TCA policy capitalizes at 10000 10000 okay. Yep. How long has it been at that level? Uh, through worship to Councillor Harris, um, well, the TCA policy is a fairly newly updated policy. Yeah. I think it was 2020, 2021. And I think we that the 10,000 threshold had been prior in prior policies. Yeah. yeah it goes that, back this, quite a few years, I think. Yeah, this is more or less just kind of an obtuse question because it doesn't relate to that. But I just couldn't remember what that amount was. <clears throat> so thank you. Okay. Okay. Going back to Councillor Batoye. 
Okay, thank you. My final question is just around the sump pump reach retrofit program. So is it time? I'm sorry? Sump pump is the next next one. Oh, yeah, ones. sorry. My apologies. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we're good on these ones for now. So you can continue on with the next ones. Thank you, Your Worship. Project 19018, the sump pump retrofit program for 600000 This is a continuation of the sump pump retrofit program, which began in 2017 and involves the connection of residential sump pumps with the city's underground stormwater system. The 2023 program will focus on houses located on Catalina Court, approximately 30 retrofits, and is to be funded from annual capital funding. A map of the planned work can be found on page 1-13. Project 19027, annual fleet and equipment replacement for 1,939,900. This program sees the annual life cycle replacement of certain vehicle fleet and equipment. As part of the city's annual asset management program, fleet and equipment undergo condition assessments on a regular basis to evaluate the need for replacement. Ensuring that replacements occur at the optimal time reduces unnecessary maintenance costs and improves fuel economy. The assets scheduled for replacement in 2023 include a backhoe loader, a loader with powered snowblower, street sweeper, light duty vehicle, and seven mowers with various sizes and attachments. Funding for this program includes approximately $1.46 million from the Mobile Equipment and Vehicle Fleet Reserve and $482,500 from trade-in values and proceeds on disposal. Project 20002, Roadway Safety Improvements for $75,000. This ongoing annual program is funded from annual capital funding and supports emerging priorities related to roadway safety improvements and the city's commitment to Vision Zero, a traffic safety strategy to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries. In 2021, preliminary design concepts were developed for traffic calming and access control on 95A Avenue and West Park Drive. For 2023, further investigation into traffic calming measures at 95A Avenue will be completed, along with the review and installation of flashing crosswalk lights at specific crosswalk locations. And that concludes my presentation of the final three annual capital programs. Directors and I would be happy to answer any clarifying questions. Okay, thank you. So I'm first in the rotation this time. So on project 2002 for 75,000, have we considered uh, increasing that budget? And I only ask that because those flashing signs, pedestrian ones, uh, just seem so valuable within the, uh, within the community. And how many do you get for 75? Um, Your Worship, it's actually one of those few things where costs have come down. Um, the, the first few we put in were in the twenty to thirty thousand dollar range. The last ones we put her in are in the seven to eight thousand dollar range. Um, it's a little bit different technology, but it does the same thing. So we've actually been able to prove, achieve some efficiencies there. So we're getting between eight and ten a year at this point, if that's all we spend money on. But we do some other evaluations, so it uh, changes a little bit from year to year. Okay, and then my second question is, do we have a plan for how many we will need in the future? Have you actually established a plan where, uh, where you would like to see these uh, all located? Um, Your Worship, we've, we've developed a list. Some of it's based on our own um, observations. Some of it's complaint-based, um, request-based, to look at those, those crosswalk locations and, and evaluate them as we go. Um, we are being more proactive now in newer neighborhoods, identifying where we'll probably need them in the future um, and trying to get them installed at that time. Um, so we, I think there's probably about a year and a half total left on our l list right now um, in terms of what we're able to purchase a year um, if we did them all. And I don't know that everything on that list is required at this time because, again, some of those evaluations still have to happen. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris, any questions on these three? And welcome, Councillor Kelly. No, we are going, just uh, so you know, we are going through the rotation that we did prior. Councillor Harris, any questions? No. Uh, Councillor Blizzard, any questions on these three? I don't have any questions. I have comments. Would you rather have them on uh, Thursday? Yes. Okay, hey, then no okay. questions. Thank you. Councillor Noyan, questions? No, thank you. Uh, uh, how much longer, if you can remind me, do we have in the sump pump retrofit program to complete the, the Siena area? Um, Your Worship, Councillor Noyan, so 
the program had a couple different um, thresholds within it. So the, the priority one, which were the highest or the, the, the worst areas, like typically where it would identify within Sienna, um, we have about two to three more years in there um, to finish those off. Um, and then we would be moving into priority two areas, at the, which were the initial report, and we're um, reevaluating those. And those would be areas within um, more towards uh, South Point. Um, so we'd be moving towards South Point in the next next few years. Okay, so Sienna then should be done based on its priority in this project in 2025, potentially summer. Roughly is, there, yes. Yeah, okay. Good to hear. Um, Next question, just in regards to the roadway safety improvements, uh, in terms of, it says funds will be allocated for further investigating uh, traffic, traffic calming measures. What, what do we plan to do as further investigation? It seems like there's already, you know, a sketch and an outline and there's been uh, public consultation in regards to ideas for, for, for this. Uh, what are we looking to do besides, yeah, besides installing the lights this year and in, in that regard? Um, the worship of council noise. So for 2023, I mean, and actually this program in general, it, it more reacts to what's emerging. So if we see an area where we're having problems, it allows us to allocate some funds to do a little bit more work in that area okay. um, and bring somebody in to, to look at some different ideas. I see. So, yeah, just some leeway then for, for, for you guys being able to open or open to what, what needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Abatoye, clarifying questions. Thank you. Um, so just back to the roadway safety improvement um, project, how do we prioritize roads for crosswalks? I'm asking that question because do we have funds that we put aside for emergencies? For example, um, um, there's a school actually that I think that it should be a crosswalk in front of. So for a place like that where, where obviously it's important, do we have like an emergency fund for these types of projects or we just have a list and then when we're, when we're done, we go to the next one? Um, your ship to Councillor Abitoy, we prioritize the list every year. Um, so it's, it's not, we, we take a look at it, see what's come on, what's emerging, what new things have come along. Um, and we try and take a look at those crosswalks um, to make sure it makes sense. Um, is, there, is there enough use? Is there enough traffic? Those kinds of things. So the list um, isn't, it's, it's a list, but it's not prioritized at this point. We'll do the prioritization through the winter um, to see where where each individual one should be. So it, it really right now comes from this fund. Um, it could be. So you have funds. a current list that you're working through. That's correct. Yes. So I guess my question was, how do you, how do you determine, is it like people come to you and say, oh, we think that this um, the crosswalk should be here or the city just goes around and decides that, okay, we need crosswalks in certain places. Um, your wish to have Councillor Abitoye, so it's, I guess just to clarify a little bit, it's about the, the flashing beacons in this case, not just the, not creating new crosswalks. Um, and it, it is a little of both. So we get uh, requests from the public saying, hey, we want you to look at this crosswalk. It's other ones that we've seen that, that maybe um, we say we should really be looking at this. And so we will look at um, things like pedestrian counts, traffic counts, um, class of roadways um, to determine a priority within those. Okay. okay, thank you. That answers my question. And and just out of curiosity, why do we have two, why do we have traffic calming and roadway safety improvements as two separate projects? Because it's kind of sound like the same thing to me. Um, so the roadway safety improvements was to be a little bit more reactive um, so that we could Look at a look at a specific roadway and do a high level assessment and not have to wait for for funding. When we get into traffic calming itself, those become bigger projects. Um, so we don't necessarily have an annual program, and they're more one off. Okay, thank you, Councillor Macon. No questions for us. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kelly. On these three, do you have any questions? Uh, good morning, everybody. Sorry I'm late. Grant, it's my recollection that approximately five years ago, the sump pump program had a 25-year plan, and, and I might be out by a year. Um, where are we in that plan? Are we keeping pace? Are we are, are we on schedule? Um, Your Worship, the Councillor Kelly, 
I believe we're pretty close. We may be again one or two years out, but um, we've been maintaining, um, I think, fairly close to what we originally planned to do. Okay, um, one or two years out. I assume one or two years behind, not ahead. Um, more than likely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, it, it's important. I would encourage administration to to keep on top of it to the best of your ability. Uh, annual fleet and equipment replacement. Refresh my memory, please. What's the what's the protocol or the the policy behind replacing um, equipment such as a deal specifically first with skid steers? Um, Your Worship, the Councillor Kelly, the skid steers are a little bit unique in that we actually replace them every year. Um, I don't think they're part of the twenty three just because of, of timing of when we're getting the twenty two ones. Um, because of the specifically on those ones, because of the discounts that we get from the uh, from the supplier because of the fleet and we're a government entity. Um, it's more cost effective to replace every year than to hour them completely out. Um, so that's one, that one's a little bit unique in terms of the, the overall program. And I noticed there, there were no skid steers in this plan. And about three years ago, I think we had two rotations in one budget. For, it, 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 that's my recollection yeah. at least. Um, roughly, how many hours are on those skid steers when they turn over on an annual basis? Uh, Your Worship, Councilor Kelly, I believe about 750 hours we put on in a year. And how many do we have? Three? Two. Two? Okay. Um, larger equipment, loaders or graders or stuff like that, how many, what's their plan? What, what's their policy? What, what's your approach on those? Um, Your Worship, Councilor Kelly, so the... Um, a loader, uh, loader backhoe, loaders and loader backhoes are replaced at a five-year interval. Um, we get um, a lot of use out of those every every year, and we get a, a very good return on investment at that point as well. Um, graders, um, just trying to think. I think the current ones are at 15. We're finding that's too long. We're running into some major repairs in that last five years. We're going to be bumping that down to 10 to 12 years um, as we move forward. We do that assessment. We have the general rule of thumb that says it's five or seven or 10 or 12 years for all of our equipment. And then we do that assessment um, as a piece of equipment comes up to make sure that that is the, the right time to do it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go on round two. Um, I did have one additional question on the roadway safety. So when you're doing, when there's a new neighborhood coming in, uh, new streets and a whole new subdivision, and also when you're doing your neighborhood roadway improvement, are you uh, putting in your engineering standards that some of those crossings will be automatically part of those pro um, uh, uh, improvements? Um, your Worship, it's not currently in the standards um, as such. We do have traffic calming within the standards. Um, so you'll see mid-block crossings and, and even corners along at intersections, you'll see bump outs being built as we go. Um, but we are in those discussions with the developers to add those lights in it, especially the mid-block ones when we have those major trail crossings. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Councillor Harris, anything further? You're good. Councillor Blizzard, anything further? You're good. Thank you. No. Okay. Councillor Noyan, anything further? Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to look at the annual fleet and, and equipment replacement uh, once again. So... I, I want to delve a little bit further into to uh, the need for replacing um, a lot of this equipment. So just looking at the biggest one, uh, the, the, the highest cost for, for one of these pieces of equipment this year, it's a loader powered snowblower. How old is a piece of equipment that, that we're replacing? Uh, your worship council, and the loader's five years old. Five years old yep. with approximately 15. You said, I think you said 15 is for loaders and graders. That's 1,500 hours. Uh, that's not 15,000. No, okay. it'll be in your worship council knowing it's probably in the 7,000 hour range. 7,000. Five to seven. Okay. So my, my question is, like, have, have you done analytics for the opportunity costs of, of repairing some of these larger pieces of equipment, for example? Uh, your worship council knowing we, we, we do. We look at what, what they're costing us. We look at what, um, what our contract with, with these five-year replacement ones specifically, we get guaranteed buyback amounts from the manufacturer. So we have a minimum amount we're going to get back um, on trade or on sale. 
Um, so we look at those things um, to determine what is the best time to, to replace. And five years seems to be about the sweet spot, sweet spot for this equipment to make sure that it's um, available when we need it um, and that uh, the, the repair costs aren't getting over what the replacement costs would be. Right. So in your, in your opinion, then this is, this is as most economical as, as we can function at, uh, uh, with, with this model. Yeah. Your worship council. And so far it has been. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Batoye, any more questions? Thank you. Councillor Macon. Did you have anything? No, nope. Councillor Kelly. Okay, so then I can go back to you, Councillor Noyan, for a couple more questions, and then we'll move on. You're good? All right, so it looks like we are good on that. So thank you very much. So we will move on to the next items, which is uh, new capital projects. Thank you, Worship. I will now invite Mr. Schaefer to present the first 2023 capital budget request. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, so the first project is Project 19009, is the Veterans Way Corridor Widening Phase 1. This is a $4,970,000 project funded by DeBenture. This project will widen Veterans Way from 101st Street to the Highway 1521 intersection. This is a PBB Quartile 3 project. The 2018 Transportation Master Plan identified the widening of Veterans Way to six lanes prior to a population of 35,000 as one of the major transportation upgrades for the city. This section of, of Veterans Way has the busiest turning movements and highest congestion issues along the highway corridor. The project will wind, widen the corridor between the 1521 intersection and 101 Street. The work will include a right turn acceleration lane off 101 Street by the fire hall, as well as an extension of the right turn lane southbound on Highway 15 towards Edmonton. This extension will tie into the 95th Street off-ramp towards downtown. The project will also include a concrete road base at the approaches to the 1521 intersection to help eliminate rutting, which re will reduce the amount of maintenance required at the intersection. This will help with snow clearing as the plows will not have to deal with the high and low spots across the lane width, allowing them to better clear the roadway. The cost of the concrete is offset over time by the reduction in the frequency of resurfacing of the area. We are currently having to mill and overlay the ruts every seven to eight years, while with a concrete basis is expected to occur every 20 years. The analysis showed that the extra cost of the concrete will re be recouped over the 40 year life expectancy of the concrete. As well, this will also reduce the inconvenience to drivers as major work will take place much less frequently. This phase of the overall widening project will have the largest impact of traffic flows as it eliminates yield conditions and improves the safety of the right turn off of 101st Street. Future phases of the corridor widening have been slotted back into the 10-year capital plan starting in 2029 to avoid the peak construction timing of the planned Dow expansion. Without the widening, it is likely that during the heavy construction periods in the heartland, whether that is new builds or turnarounds, the congestion will result in drivers looking for alternate routes through the city and use 86th Avenue Southward Drive and 99th Avenue in an attempt to bypass the congestion. If the project is delayed, a mill and overlay will take place at the intersection of highways 15 and 21 in 2023. This will be done as part of the road rehabilitation program, as this has been deferred for a couple of years with the pending widening project. There is a $370,000 operating impact for debt servicing starting in 2023, plus a $14,400 operating impact in public works for maintenance of the widened roadway. Be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. So remember, two questions each. Councillor Harris, you're first. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, what's the uh, proposed design look at in terms of split between urban and rural cross-section uh, within this? And the reason I ask the question is, is primarily the impact on our drainage systems in that area. Obviously, they are different. Um, your Worship, Councillor Harris, because the drainage systems were never extended into that area, um, it will be more or less as you see it now where the northbound lanes there's actually a curb and more of an urban section the southbound lanes are a rural section that have the ditch um, and that will be maintained and that's really to, to deal with uh, the stormwater um, as you mentioned there's no drainage system within that area to support yeah so in other words the analysis has not looked at the introduction of a drainage system in here other other than it's going to continue to be overland flow 
into areas that uh, ultimately are there currently, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, if we subject to that, if we did that, it would significantly impact the cost of the development. Uh, yes, Your Worship Council Harris, it would be that be millions, I'm sure, to bring a storm yeah. line okay. up there. Yes. Well, then that's prudent from that standpoint. Second question. Um, what what analysis is being done uh, for the new bridge introduction in terms of what that's likely to do on either the north or the southbound flow on Highway 2115? Um, Your Worship of Council Harris, so all the analysis that was done through our transportation master plan and then the regional models that supported that are the other way around, sorry, um, assumed the bridge was there, um, that it was four lanes into the city um, coming in with, with the new bridge open and the traffic growing over time within the city itself. Um, what it actually showed is that with the, with the bridge opening, there's actually a, a bump in traffic, um, kind of a you, when you build it, they will come kind of thing um, that will be drawn to that area. Um, so there's a slight bump and then it just grows over time with the typical growth patterns that you see. Um, but all the modeling assumed that the bridge was there. Okay, so ultimately it's assuming a growth factor that ultimately is designed to handle. That's correct. Okay. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blizzard, do you have a couple questions? I do. Um, so for the uh, Veterans Way corridor widening, um, will the on-ramp from 101 Street to the west or southbound lane be longer? Right now it's so short that you can't, there's no integration. You have to come to a full stop pretty much to check even the traffic and then go on. It's so, so short. Um, Your Worship to Council of Blizzard, there will be a full acceleration lane um, plus the third lane. So there'll be a section there. It's actually four lanes wide. Okay, and one more on that one. Um, is Are there any cost savings or because of the uh, concrete and we have to dig it all up? Um, most of the eastbound or I think you've called it northbound lane are already three lanes. There's only a tiny little piece that isn't. Uh, Your Worship of Council of Blizzard, that's correct. Um, the last pork chop, I guess, that goes into the uh, um, extra foods or no frill site, that last one will actually get cut back and then the, extent, the lane will be extended out uh, where the curb comes out where that lane's cut off. So the third lane will actually drop at 101st, but there will be a right turn lane as well created. So we do have some cost efficiencies there? Uh, that's correct. That's factored into the, into the project, yes. Okay, I have some more on the other item. Okay, I will come around after. Councillor Noyan on this one, a couple questions. Yeah, I did, I did have a few questions about the phases of the, the, that change of this project, but I think they've been answered. My question is, if we, if we go ahead with, with phase one, obviously we're, we're improving pedestrian safety considerably, but uh, for traffic volume through Fort Saskatchewan, I, I, I fail to see how there, there's going to be an improved impact given that that's one section in the middle of our city. Um, Your Worship Councilor Noyan, there's, there's a couple areas I think that you would, you would see that impact. So the, the first will be that right turn lane off of the fire, at the fire hall with a full acceleration lane being able to merge over rather than that full stop yield condition. Um, it's a, it's a flow and a safety thing because you're not necessarily expecting that dual left to be coming into you. Um, the other, uh, one actually is at the 1521 intersection. So you have right now, um, the right turn lane off of 15 towards the, towards the river. Um, people tend to yield as they come off because you have straight through traffic coming off of 94th, you have dual lefts. Um, turning onto that stretch. So there's, there's an acceleration lane, but it's not always used. Um, with the third lane, and so when you get that yield, it backs up, and that right turn traffic then is waiting to go until the light's clear. Uh, with the third lane on the outside, that right turn lane now is a free flow out, um, and it, it just, it, the, it's extended then towards the 95th Street off-ramp, so that, that right turn traffic can can accelerate towards 95th Street and then just merge over one lane. There will be no full yield condition there at that point. So I think that's where your big impact of traffic is, is that um, that outside lane then becomes your right turn lane from 101st all the way to the 
1521 intersection. Okay, so effectively at that major intersection, we're creating an efficient zipper merge as opposed yeah. to what we have now. Okay, I appreciate that explanation. My other question is, is uh, uh, are, are we aware that Dow is is on track with its timeline for for its project? Uh, your worship to council, and I haven't heard any updates since the last one at council, but maybe there's others that I don't know about. Yeah, just thinking into the future of this project. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Abatoye. Couple of questions. Thank you. Um, my first question is: um, so phase one, that's where um, the intersection of fifteen and twenty-one. That's where they meet, right? Um, so as we go ahead with, um, you know, um, expanding the shores, the ability to um, just thinking about Vision Zero and the five E's and engineering being one of them, is there an ability to make that intersection safer for our community? Um, Your Worship to Council Arbitrary, they're always, the intersections as they're designed are always reviewed um, and always best practices as implemented where we can. Um, the next project we're presenting moves pedestrians out of that area um, to help that piece. Um, it's it's a it is a difficult intersection. It is a busy intersection. Um, so we're we try and improve it as best we can every time we're in there. Yes, I'm just I'm just yeah. um, hoping that as we go ahead with this project, that that's actually actually is also put into consideration. Thank you. Um, th my second question is more because it seems like phase one is going to be like a three to four year project, while all the other phases is just one year. I'm I'm just going based on the ten year capital plan and the funds that we've put towards this um, project. Am I correct? Um, your Worship Council, I tell you the intent would be to build this in one year. The widening would happen in one year. Oh, but um, page 2-1 says that if we, if we don't do it in 2023, then we'll do it, um, we'll complete it from 29 to 32. Uh, yes, Your Worship to Council, I tell you, so the, it would then just be lumped in to the start of the next phases. Okay, so, and so everything yeah. just follows. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Macon. Questions on this one? Um, I think most of my questions have been answered already. Just for a point of clarification on your response to Councillor Blizzard. So on the northbound section, it wouldn't essentially create mostly four lanes. You're just going to utilize that third lane and complete it. That's correct. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly, a couple of questions? Yes, thank you. Um, Grant, my experience on that highway would indicate that what is proposed as phase one and secondly what is proposed as phase two tend to back up the worst when we have heavy industrial action in the community. Um, did you give any thought to doing one and two together to reduce some of that it, it jams up around the golf course every time there's a shutdown going on, every time there's construction. We get two or 300 buses on the road, plus all of the cars. I, I would think that the biggest bang for the buck would be doing phase one and phase two at the same time and getting them both out of the way so that that right turn lane, for instance, proceeds right from 114th Street through to the bridge. Um, you worship with Councillor Kelly. We, we broke it into phases more or less to do with costing. Um, trying to keep each annual project relatively the same. Um, I'd agree that there is there's advantages if we can speed up the process, but it's not something that we brought forward at this time. So if we did phase one in 23, theoretically we could do phase two in 24 and still, I think, beat the Dow schedule if, in fact, that goes ahead. I'm trusting my memory here. Uh, I'm not sure I can answer that one. I can't remember what that final schedule was, Your, your Worship. Would it be possible? So are we flagging right now? Just to ask to flag if we have consensus, and we will have uh, greater discussion and debate on Thursday on these. So, yes, you can ask for it to be flagged. I'd like to ask that it be flagged. I'd like to address that one particular suggestion, please, Grant. Okay. Thank you. So what I'm going to do, we don't require a vote unless there's consensus. So I'm just going to ask if anybody objects to this one being flagged. Not seeing any. So this one will get flagged for Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Um, one, may I continue? We'll give you one more and then we'll see if there's any additional questions. Thank you. 
Uh, will it be possible during this process, Grant, to level the intersections, and I'm thinking particularly of 101st Street and the 84th Street cross traffic on Highway 15? Um, they're not terrible at the moment, but they're far from, far from good. Uh, it, when you approach an intersection, you ought to have a clear line of sight for what's coming at you on the other side of the intersection. And on those particular inter two intersections, for sure, you simply do not. Um, leadership to Council Kelly, so we'll look at that. We do evaluate those based on standards in terms of what the, the, the tax standards are for sight lines and, 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 and exactly what you're saying. Um, it's tough to change those elevations much just because of cost. Um, I think at this point, um, what I've seen from the design and then the pre-design um, is the intent isn't to adjust those um, significantly um, for the sight lines do meet standard um, in terms of what you can see and what you can't and from what distances. So at this point, there's not a, a plan to do any significant changes there. Okay. Would it be possible for you to include in your response on Thursday some estimates as to what maybe could be done that would be relatively efficient to improve the situations please and i'm good thank you okay thank you i'm the last one in the round of uh, this one for questions so i guess my question to you is um ipl just went through just went through um their their building over the five years and they had up to five thousand uh on site uh northwest refinery had five to eight thousand on site that were going through our community so i guess the question that i have is so if dow goes ahead do we really anticipate the impact to be any greater uh versus the cost of doing this project because I, I guess the second question is, we asked administration to push this out last year, and yet it, it's back here. So do we really anticipate doing this one phase will really resolve what your concerns are, given that we've had this volumes of traffic over the last 30 years? Um, Your Worship, I think it's, it's a... It's a tough one to answer. Um, I mean, traffic patterns continue to grow. Um, we did have, obviously, a downturn in traffic over the last couple of years with, uh, with COVID coming through and people working from home. Um, we're starting to see that pick up again, and we have seen that pick up again. Um, when you go, th go out there, some of that's due to some other construction that's going on. I will absolutely think that that's true right now. Um, but as what we've seen in the past um, is that People get through, um, but it spreads the time. So instead of having a, a peak one hour, we have a peak two hours, or we, it just it gets wider and wider. And then we start seeing uh, more and more people cutting through other areas of the city. Um, so 99th Avenue starts getting busier as people come through there and try and bypass that to come out by on the 95th Street where they start using South Fort Drive um, to come around. Um, so... I guess the answer to that is, is traffic continues to grow as the city grows and as the heartland grows. So when you start adding these projects on, um, and we're always going to have a project. So whether it's a new build or a turnaround or something like that, there's always a major project happening. Um, so those are part of our background traffic now. And it is starting to, uh, to cause some congestion issues within the city, and they're going to continue to grow over time. Um, so by picking away at it now, um, we can get a little bit ahead now, maybe weather a bit of a storm and then pick up again. So I guess my second question is, um, in the EMRB IR TMP plan, uh, eventually there will be another road that will go um, outside of Fort Saskatchewan that will be a bypass. We'll call it a bypass, uh, another major road. So I guess the question that I that I really have with that is to invest this money into this. So if that other road happens within the 25-year window, would that not reduce the amount of traffic that would be utilizing this? Um, Your Worship, the modeling shows, the, the EMRB modeling and our tra transportation master plan both showed um, within the... 
I don't, I want to put a year around it, but say within a 50,000 population window, 50 to 55 was what the years um, went out for us, that both six lanes are required on the highway and the industrial bypass, for lack of a better word, uh, were both required. Um, previous transportation master plans had um, the, the industrial bypass being built first and then six lanes following at the 30 and 50,000 uh, person uh, triggers. Uh, in 2018, we looked at that and said it's unlikely we're going to get that regional road built within that kind of time frame. It makes more sense to do the work in the city first and then lobby to get that um, industrial bypass built um, as we grow. Okay, so the item is flagged, so I'm just going to ask uh, if you need a round two, if there is a question that you will need answered uh, for Thursday that they would need to plan to bring additional information back. Okay, so I'm just going to go through one more time. Councillor Harris, anything? Well, I have a general question, but it's not. No, that's so fine. Okay. That's fine. Okay, so go ahead. We'll go around. So, Mr. Schaefer, the uh, phase one project involves probably significant structure change over Ross Creek. Is that correct? Uh, You've got two structures there that uh, allow Ross Creek to flow under the highway. Your worship council has to be phase two, which is when we get to Ross Creek. Uh, oh, okay, so it's just probably right on the boundary between phase one and two? Yeah, it will be just past 101st Street, so we'll be coming back into the... Okay, so in other words, my question was, uh, that's fairly significant where, whenever it is. Uh, it, it is that it, the, the plan right now is actually to be able, we can extend those culverts out and it may be more of an urban cross-section through there to reduce the cross-section, but... Yeah, okay, so in that area, when you get around to that construction point, uh, are we going to be pulling the structures to the inside of the road or pushing it to the outside of the road? What's uh -huh. your design? Your worship, the councillors is still on the outside. The extra lane will be on the outside, but it's probably going to be an urban section through there. Yeah, okay. Good. Fair enough. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Blizzard. Anything further on this one? I do on the Veterans Way pedestrian crossing. Okay. That's the next one we'll be doing. We're still so on. So you the... want me to wait? Yeah, that's well, they the were next both project. Together, so, okay. Okay, that's I'll wait. Okay. Councillor Noyan, anything further on this one? No. Uh, Councillor Abatoye? Thank you. So it seems like we're, we're really just trying to be proactive in, um, because of the likelihood of congestion happening. But can you talk to me about the life cycle of this road? Um, as we widen the road, is the current roadways, are they also going to be worked on to ensure that, you know, um, the life cycles are extended or is it just going to be widened? Um, your Ship Councillor Abatoy, as part of the project, the, the existing lanes will be rehabbed, but that's just a, a mill and an overlay. They're coming up on to be due anyway, so we'll just get rolled into that. Okay. So that means the life cycle, that gets to the end of the life cycle. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Macon, anything further? Um, is that a question, a point of clarification on the process for today and Thursday, actually? Um, flagged items are items that we want further information, correct, to be brought back, but we can debate any item on Thursday. We don't have to flag it to make sure we're going to talk about it. Through your okay. worship, that is correct. Okay, thank you. But it is better for administration if an item is flagged, if you wish to debate it, so if there's additional information. But it, we, will de we can debate any of these on Thursday, but if there's additional information that they require, that's yeah. the important part. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure because I know yeah. that we have comments on them, but we're not doing comments, so. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly, further questions? Thank you. Uh, Grant, you, you raised an interesting point in your comments around people trying to avoid the congestion by taking alternate routes through the developed areas of Fort Saskatchewan. It's also my understanding that Highway 15 in particular is, is a high accident area in Fort Saskatchewan. Could you include in your report just some brief information on accident history, phase one and phase two, and whether or not doing phase two 
earlier would help with the um, cut across traffic situation that, that, that I certainly see in South Fort on a, on a regular basis. Okay, so that's just a request for information. Yep, thank you. Okay, so it looks like we are done with that one then, so you can uh, proceed on with 21012 Veterans Way Pedestrian. Uh, thank you. Project 21012 is Veterans Way Pedestrian Crossing North. This is a $3,565,000 project funded by MSI and the Canada Community Building Fund. This is a quartile two project. This project will construct a grade separated pedestrian crossing at the 15, Highway 1521 intersection. This project can only proceed at this budget if it is in conjunction with the widening project as there are synergies to the construction of both projects at the same time. Construction of a grade separated crossing at an estimated cost of $5 million was included in the traffic safety survey in 2021. 65% of respondents supported or somewhat supported construction of a crossing at this location. The crossing of Veterans Way with the 70 km hour speed limit and a large percentage of heavy trucks is intimidating at best. This grade separated crossing will eliminate an at grade crossing location, providing a safe crossing for the city's trail network. This crossing will have the added benefit of maintaining traffic flows along Veterans Way as the pedestrian signal timing can be, remo can be removed from the intersection. Uh, with this crossing, the at grade crossings of Veterans Way will be closed at this location. The project supports Vision Zero and was identified in the 2018 Transportation Master Plan. There's a $16,500 operating impact to roads and parks for this project. Okay, thank you. So we'll go into questions. Councillor Blizzard, you're first. Uh, yeah, I definitely have a couple of questions and maybe more as others ask. Um, is this area part of the highway being widened? I'm looking at the location. So it's on the... Uh, west side of the in big intersection right um your worship councillor blizzard that's correct um it's but it's with it's within the extents of phase one um, as we transition back from the from the six lanes to four lanes they'll extend west of that intersection um so these are within the uh, within the extents of the project okay so it would need to be done so we're doing quite a ways back because there's a big island in the middle so you're going to be redoing some of this like how far back are you going from that intersection? Uh, Your Worship, the Council of Blizzard, I believe it's about 150 meters away from the intersection. Um, that'll be coming back in with all the transitions. Okay, I just hope whenever we do it, whatever intersections, we don't end up redoing stuff twice just because uh, it wasn't done right the first time. Um, I may have some more, I think I'm okay for at the moment. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Noyan. Questions? No, you're good for now. Councillor Abatoye, you're good for now. Councillor Macon, Councillor Kelly, you just hit your button, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Grant, when I look at that picture, I got to say, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> and I don't know what the alternative is, uh, but, but I see that potentially as being perceived at least as a safety risk. I see it being something dark and at nighttime, I'm not sure I would want to wander through there. So what can we do in the design and use of that to alleviate some of those concerns? Um, your worship of Councillor Kelly, these discussions we've had when we looked at, at how we can how we can do this crossing um, with the grade constraints we have and the, the amount of elevation change we have. There's not it's going to be very similar to what you see in the picture in terms of looks. Um, it will be two and a half meters tall and four and a half meters wide, so I think it'll be a bigger opening than what's what's shown there. And I would say that the lighting will be a lot better than what you see in there currently, though it's. In a picture like this, it's tough because it's so bright on either ends that the, it, it does make it darker in the middle. Um, those concerns are always there with this type of structure. Um, and we can, we'll, we'll light it, we'll make it the openings as wide as we can so that you can see through as you're coming. You're not, not having a, a blind walk within. Would it be possible to include high resolution monitoring cameras for security? Um, 
Your, your worship at Council Kelly, I, I believe that shouldn't be an issue to, to add something like that. Could that be done after the fact? Uh, it could be done after. It would probably be more cost effective to do it as we go, and we'll look at that to see where that fits. Do we need to flag it to have you look at that? Uh, your worship at Council Kelly, I don't believe so. We'll, if assuming the project moves forward, it's something that will. Councillor we'll Kelly, I would recommend the be flagged because the other one is being flagged and they go hand in hand. I'm good with that. I, I would ask that it be flagged. And, and for that reason, in my, I don't like the look, Grant, but I don't have an alternative for you. I, I, it's a problem. Okay. Um, so, so the security is an issue in my mind. So yes, please, let's flag it. Okay. So I will just do a check with council. Is there anybody opposed to having this flagged? No, they're good. Okay. So it will be flagged for Thursday. So we'll see if there's any additional questions. Are you fin Okay. You're good. Okay, so I'm next on the speaking order. Um, so I had some questions, well, even with your operating impact. So um, you've got 16,500. Uh, the amount of graffiti that, that we see going on in the neighborhood, um, you actually believe that that dollar amount is going to be sufficient? And how are you going to deal with ensuring that these are done so that we can prohibit uh, graffiti all through there? Uh, Your Worship, unfortunately, graffiti is something that's tough to prohibit. Um, there are, I guess, other things we, we look at um, in terms of do you include some proactive, I don't want to call it graffiti, but an art piece of, of that style um, where it, it deters some of it and you can then touch up to get rid of anything that's um, shouldn't be there, I guess, rather than just having bare concrete. Okay, uh, that's fine. And then the second question that I have, so this is on the further the south side of the intersection. Um, I guess, do you honestly believe that people that are crossing 1521 are going to go across Highway 15, uh, go all the way over there, cross there, and then come back and across 94th Street if you say you're taking out the, uh, the uh, pedestrian signals? Uh, you worship, that's the intent, yes. Okay, so I won't debate that right now, but I would totally disagree with you. So we'll go on to uh, round two. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Councillor Harris, you're still in the in the first round. Go. So picking up on Councillor Kelly's um, point of view, was there a formal SEPTED analysis done on this underpass? Um, you worship at Councillor Harris, I don't know if we not? formalized one, but we did informally do one in terms of what best practices are for something like this, but we can formalize that. Yeah, and when we talk about it, this this is the type of infrastructure that that sort of analysis can and should be undertaken. And it's a very objective analysis. And so I, Councillor Kelly raises some very valid points. So respecting the fact that you've put forward a picture that probably was not the best picture that you could have used, but it's a picture nonetheless. Is there You're a saying it would be different, and, uh, and so the question is, was the SEPTED, and if not, how could you do it? I wish the Council Harris, we, we can just have it done. It's not a, at this point. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's crucial because it'll, it'll come up at some point. So uh, looking at the actual design of the intersection, um, the chevron uh, stripes going across, so those are just stop lines, or are you suggesting those are crosswalks? Uh, worship to Council Harris, are you the ones across Highway 15 and 194 Street? Yeah, yeah. Those would be the crosswalks that remain open. Okay, so those remain open and they still will have pedestrian crossing That's correct. protection at that point. Yes. Okay, all right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll see if there's anything further on round two. Councillor Blizzard. Yeah, I do have a question actually. Now that you mentioned that they'll be crossing the other way, um, when once they're through this, so is there steps? How are they getting up? Because that'd be an elevation change. Um, Your Worship, Councillor Blizzard, the the trails you'd be following the existing trail system, so you tie into the existing trails that are there now. But so it circles around. I'm just, are they right at the intersection where they're going to be crossing? 
uh, Your Worship Council Blizzard, so the existing crosswalks would remain going across 50 and across 94th Street, um, and they would tie into the existing trails. And then the, the new crossing the, um, that we're talking about then would just extend the trails out the end to tie into those existing trails. So it would be the same slopes that are there now. Okay, so it's far enough from the corner that uh, they can then follow the pathway up to the uh, lights? That's correct, yes. On the south side? Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan, anything further questions? Yeah, I have a question. Whoops, sorry. I pushed. I have a question. Just, Just a second here. Third times. Okay, go ahead. Question about the structural life and potential degradation of, of this type of structure. And maybe I'm looking, this picture is getting in my head too, because there only looks like about a meter of, uh, of space above the, the tunnel for, for roadway. Given the amount of industrial traffic that we have on Highway 15, we're not going to be able to catch all of the overloaded uh, lar large trucks as well, potentially. Like what, what can we expect as the life ex expectancy of, of, a, of a tunnel, a pedestrian corridor like this? And there, are there any concerns in that regard? Um, you worship the council, no So the, like any bridge, it'll be a 75 year life, build life. Um, that's the life expectancy of it. Um, and it ac actually is a structural part of the roadway because like this picture, we don't have a lot of grade above. Um, so that's taken into account. So technically this would make a better roadway <laughs> beneath this section than not if there's a 75 year life expectancy. Um, the worship of council, no So it'll tie into what we're planning in terms of the, um, the concrete base that's going to be underneath the roadways as well. So it'll all be one structure underneath. I don't say it'll be better, but it'll be um, as good because we typically don't have to go down to repair base. All right. Good enough. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Abatoy, anything further? You're good. Councillor Macon, anything further? Councillor Kelly? Yes, please. One more quick question. Okay. Um, with the removal, assuming this gets done, the crosswalks across 1521 then go away. Would that allow us, it's allow the city to change the timing on the lights to, to, to pass more traffic through that intersection? Uh, Your Worship, Councilor Kelly, that's correct. Um, we wouldn't have to have that pedestrian delay when the, when the buttons are hit. Thank you, Grant. Okay, thank you. Uh, so my other question, it still comes back to those green dotted things on there so you're saying people coming from uh from the north will still be able to cross highway 15 at the intersection because of those dotted lines you're still going to have the crosswalk uh your worship that's correct okay so how is that going to work if you're widening the road to six lanes and you're going to have more people more traffic coming around that curve to go on to highway 15 won't that be potentially a greater hazard to pedestrians um your worship i don't know if there's more traffic i mean more traffic's building all the time um again it, it is a it's an at-grade crossing, and, and people have to respect the, the pedestrians and, and be aware of the crossing. So it's, it's fundamentally no different than it is now going in that direction, but uh, it's is what we can do at this point. The, the other option, I guess, depending on where you're coming from, if you're coming from um, the Sheridan neighborhood, is there's another pedestrian crossing at that point by the, uh, by the main reservoir after you come across and up. If you're at that intersection, that's a, a long ways out of the way, but that is an option. So you just said there's not going to be any more traffic. So if there's not going to be any more traffic, then why do we need to do this? That's, uh, that's a yeah. redundant question. Uh, you don't need to answer that. Uh, Councillor Harris, you're next. Whoops. Okay. So the offset to this is to create a grade separated intersection. What would the general cost? Surely you know what that would cost to put a grade separated intersection here. Your worship, the Councillor Harris, probably in the 30 to $40 million standpoint, and that was a couple, few years ago. Okay, so that definitely is not an alternative. So anytime we're going to maintain an integration of pedestrian and vehicle traffic at an intersection, this is the only alternative. Is that what I'm taking you to suggest? Uh, your worship, the Councillor Harris, at this point, this is the, the best alternative we have, yes. Would uh, second question? Would we ever anticipate seeing a grade separated intersection at this location? Uh, Your Worship, we may somewhere down the 
down the road, but uh, we're trying to avoid that given the, the capital costs involved. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So that appears to be all the questions on that. I'm getting inundated with a comfort break. So um, the time is 1040. Is five minutes or 10 minutes? Give me your five, so 10, 10. Okay, and then because we will be breaking for lunch at 1130. So back in your seats uh, promptly at uh, 1050. So we are in recess.
Okay, the time is uh, 10.50, so we will resume the meeting. And uh, so we will begin with the next item, which is Fort Center Park. Thank you, Your Worship. And members of council, my name is Richard Gagnon, I'm the Public Works Director. And I'll be presenting a uh, capital budget with the support of uh, Janelle Hart, Pub Park Services Manager. Starting with uh, capital project 21023, the Fort Center Park Phase 1 construction that you can find in your uh, budget package on page 211. The project falls uh, in quarter, uh, quartile two with significant score and demand reliance and population served and aligns with the strategic goal of uh, thriving recreation, culture and parks. The Fort Center Park master plan update was completed in April 2020, providing the vision for a regional park in the 40 hectares of open space on the lower terrace between the Highway 15 bridge and the Fort Heritage Precinct. The Fort Center Park Master Plan recommends the development that development occurs in two phases. Phase one focus on trail development, establish an interpretive program, as well as restorative measures to further naturalize the site and also make it more accessible for their use. This request found, uh, found construction of phase one in 2023. The 2021 budget founded the detailed design of Fort Center Park. Phase one at a cost of $80,000, refining the scope and a cost estimate for the project. This was completed uh, recently in 2022. Phase one includes several enhancements intended to encourage passive and active recreation. Three options have been prepared for council in the document consideration for varying costs and features. The recommended options aim at improving access to the site with the new gravel trail network, staircases with bike ramp. This option also includes reclaimed landscape using a naturalization around the new storm ponds, pollinator gardens, trees and shrubs. Site enhancement will also include day use sites play in classroom elements, as well as signage and wayfinding. Typically the things you see in a park. The cost of the recommended option is $1.57 million, and the associated ongoing operating impact is $19,000 starting in 2024. This project is founded under MSI. I may be able to answer your questions. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Noyan, your first one for question. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I just had a question about the, the level of reclamation we can expect from the contractors that are working there right now when it gets turned over to the city. So is, is that going to look like a, a topsoil site? Is that going to be clay with the ponds? Or, or what are we taking over from them uh, if this project goes ahead? Uh, Your Worship to Councillor Inouyen, uh, for the, the, my understanding is that the ponds will be built and then uh, the, uh, the, the site will be back to where it used to be before they did the work there. So some of the reclamation will include seeding, restoration work as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Abatoye, questions? No questions. Uh, Councillor Macon? Go ahead. Richard, just to follow up on the last question, what is the timeline for that to be turned back over to us? Your Worship to Councillor Macon, uh, uh, from what I heard uh, f from our, our engineering group, uh, we're looking at uh, the storm ponds to be completed uh, this year, um, late fall, uh, maybe uh, around October, November as well as the, uh, and then there will be remediation work and seeding and everything else that I anticipate will happen in the spring. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Go ahead. You bet, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, why a staircase? Um, they're not accessible for, for, for some portion of our population. You can't easily, obviously, ride a bike down them. Why wouldn't we just extend the trap path system and do the figure eight or figure S figure or whatever we have to do to get down the bank with the path system? Yeah. 
Uh, your ship to Councilor Kelly, I think we use, uh, you know, staircase when we have a steep slope mainly. And then uh, there's different ways to do that. We can basically have a trail that comes in an S going down, right? And having a, you know, a more gentle slope to do that. Staircase is another way to, another way to do this. Uh, the um, uh, wire staircase, I mean, this is something we looked at at two of them. Uh, I think one closer to the uh, what used to be what well, what we call the old jail cemetery, close to uh, the the old jail bridge, and another one a bit um, uh, closer to uh, Mid Park. So, um, and what we we're recommending in terms of staircase is something that is more like Hertz type of staircase, where they can be integrated into the slope. So, if if this particular proposal is approved by council. The staircase will be part of the part of the construction plan. Yes, the staircase will be part of a construction plan. Thank you. Um, I, I I don't have enough information to, to debate it, and I, we can't. I'd just like to flag it for discussion on staircase versus um, pathway to, to get the same access. Okay, I'll just ask council if anybody has any objections to this being flagged. Doesn't appear to be so, so that one will be flagged. So you're good on your questions then? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'm next in the speaking order. Um, so the question that I have is you've got new gravel trail network. How much more expensive is it to do the asphalt, given that gravel is going to be significantly different than our current service level of trails? Your ship to uh, your ship. I may ask Mr. Schaefer for what well, normally is this cost for uh, asphalt per meter for a three meter type of. Uh... And as he's coming up with that question, the second question with that is it not cheaper to do it at the time of construction versus having to come back a following year? So they tie together those questions. Um. Trying to think what the number would be. I might have to get back to you with the number just so I can yeah. accurate. I don't want to throw something out that's okay, going to be that's way out. Fine. Um, in terms of your second one, um, it is a different set of equipment that comes in. So, unless there's a whole bunch of base repairs that you have to do between when you install the gravel to go where you go asphalt, it shouldn't be too much difference of, because it is a different set of equipment that you're bringing in anyway. Okay, so you'll just you'll just bring the uh, answer on Thursday then. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Harris. Uh, yeah, this is probably to you, Grant. So looking at the design uh, that is in the package, um, it talks about boardwalks being constructed in various locations. One of them across uh, one of the storm ponds. It said the in the note boardwalk built only if ponds are able to retain water looks to me when I drive by that those ponds that have been excavated, assuming that they're at design elevations and that sort of stuff, are retaining water. I uh, to Council Harris, that's correct. Is that primarily because there isn't much of an outflow out of that area and it would be normal percolate, percolation into the into the soil conditions in that area? Um, Your Worship of Council Harris, so currently that would be groundwater that's actually coming up for the okay. most part. Um, and we are planning, there are two outfalls, storm outfalls that we have that come down there. One of them needs work anyway, and the other one's very close. We're going to redirect those into the pond, uh, into those ponds and create them as uh, storm ponds as well. So it's effectively a stormwater management system similar to what we have, in, well, similar to what we've got in West Park. So then it comes into storm water, one goes to two, and then eventually is it the same, same idea of elevation changes and when it gets to a certain stand, it goes over a weir and then out to the main drain course? Uh, Your Worship, the Council Harris, there'll be a, a structure of some kind um, between the two. Um, there probably won't be a whole lot of elevation differences because yeah. there's not a lot of grade there. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I, and then the outfall that ultimately goes to the river is where we have an existing board rock bridge that they pulled out, put off to the side, and then they were driving trucks through there most of the time during construction of the bridge. Uh, that's correct. They'll be putting that back. Okay, the so then that'll be the outfall to the river, and it'll stay that way. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blissard, questions? Actually, I have a few questions, so I'll probably have to go a couple of times for this. 
Um, the first one is, have we considered a bike park, you know, mountain bike park? I know that was in the talks and there was people pushing it a few years ago. Um, is this going to be part of a future phase? Are we looking at it? Your ship to um, Council of Blizzard, at this time it is not in the plan to add a, um, a bike park into uh, the design of this park. Uh, I've not, I don't have the details of uh, phase two, which comes uh, much later. This is phase one with basically uh, a focus on accessibility um, and, and, and some aspect of, of programming like uh, described in the, in the document here. But that aspect of a, uh, a major bike uh, park, for, for example, is, is not in phase one. Okay, I suppose if someone's interested, they can push us for phase two and maybe ask around. Um, picnic area. Um, so when you have a picnic area and people go for a while, they do need to go to the washroom if they're drinking and eating. Are there going to be washrooms or would we do temporary ones, you know, the summer washrooms? Uh, you were shipped to Councilor Blizzard at this time. There's not really a permanent washroom plan in phase one. That could come in phase two. Uh, at this time, we will use as uh, the usual porter potty that we see in parks. Okay, I have a couple more questions, so maybe if you want to come back to me. Okay, sounds good. Councilor Noyan, do you have anything further? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And, and this might be a, a phase two consideration as well, but uh, it's, it's just in regards to naturalized areas versus open mode areas. So open mode areas as proposed un under this design would be would, would be turf. Um, th that seems to re require considerable or well, some maintenance, I guess, uh, um, from the city. I guess, has, has there been any consideration on either naturalizing those areas and, and maybe what it, what is the benefit to having a mode area that, that we could use? And then um, on the other side of that, if it is a mode area, would it be something you use for like soccer or something like that potentially? Uh, you were shipped to Councilor Noe, and I don't believe that the intent of the design was to create like a, a field um, a playing field or something like that. It was more like in terms of natural grasses that we normally mow based on our standards uh, and what you have seen in the past over there. So, but at this time, that could be maybe something considered in phase two as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Batoye, anything? You're good. Councillor Macon, anything further? You're good. Councillor Kelly? You're good. I just have one question. So we have the snake cavern pit that's on that side. So how is that going to impact the development? Because we have heard from residents, there's an abundance of them that live in that area. So, so do we anticipate uh, uh, that's going to cause any problems as we move into the future with people down there? And mm -hmm. uh, through your worship, my understanding is the snake pit, I will call it that way, uh, is uh, protected by our environment as well. It's not so, the question that I asked. So are we going to consider this in, as we're developing? Absolutely. We'll look at it. And then... Uh, and, 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 and what we try to do is to keep those animals in their natural environment as much as we can. Okay, Councillor Harris, further questions? So, Richard. Just a second. So, Richard, phase one of this project ultimately is taking where the excavation has taken place that the contractor had to do for the highway and the bridge construction returning it basically to a relatively attractive format with some trail enhancements. So effectively, we're not doing a whole heck of a lot to it until we get into subsequent phases. So this will return it to a green space, by and large. Uh, Your Worship to Councillor Iris, absolutely. And then what we want to do is to also enhance the experience with uh, more places for people to, um, you know, access some picnic shelters or even for schools to go down and then, uh, you know, do some interpretation as well through wayfinding and signs and things like that. So this area is a gateway into our community and we want it to look as natural and attractive as possible, correct? That's correct. Do you believe this design will, will make that happen? I do. Okay. Okay. Thank you. 
just a second here, see where I'm at. Councillor Blizzard, do you have anything further? I do. So it talks about vehicular traffic. Are we talking cars? Are we going to have a parking lot? And how would they access it if it is cars? Your worship to Councillor Blizzard, um, at this time, we don't foresee vehicle traffic uh, in the area other than maybe some, uh, you know, a city truck having to go down and, and to remove garbage or to do some maintenance or things like that. Um, uh, this is more for phase two, I believe, that uh, there was uh, potentially <laughs> some parking and vehicle traffic. Okay, and when phase two comes forward, I'll ask more about that then. Um, the other thing was it was already brought up this staircase, um, and it kind of looks like in the picture the steel staircase. So I'm assuming a staircase would be because it's a shortcut versus taking because it's all lower uh, versus taking a longer route that goes down a hill, which is fine. Um, but when we do a steel staircase, and I know I've tried that with my dog, animals aren't crazy about those what do you call them? holes and steel staircases? I'm kind of thinking maybe a natural, the gravel pitcher would be a better one. And what's the difference? I think it mentioned the cost, but um, we didn't break out a lot of these costs. Can we get that broken out on Thursday? Your ship to uh, Councillor Blizzard. Um, what we, we looked at is... Uh, Based on the, 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 I believe it came from the master plan to look at steel staircase or wood staircase, and when we look at these um, and when we, we price everything, uh, we found that uh, those items, especially the steel and and the wood, was pretty expensive at this time. And then there's a lot of price variation right now with uh, what happened with COVID over the the last two years. So we agree that uh, the embedded hearth staircase is maybe a very good option to look at. Uh, these are basically into the embedded into the the slope, and um, they they also um, in terms of cost. And I'll use some round numbers here. So for the ones that we we're looking at, uh, is in the fifty thousand dollar range compared to a steel staircase that can come up to the the, the five hundred uh, over five hundred thousand. And again, there's a, just a different type of engineering needed for for each staircase. I've seen the uh, the hurt staircase in many places in Sturgeon County in Edmonton as well as in Banff uh, if uh, people enjoy Banff and you you go around the, the river uh, you'll see many of those they're well integrated and it's very natural and they're easy to maintain as well and it looks really good it gives you a good feel as well okay I agree and that's all my questions Okay, thank you. So this item has been flagged, so it'll come back Thursday. So we'll move. Thank you very much. So we'll move on to 23002, Traffic Calming Implementation. Your Worship. Oh, yes. Sorry, just a point of clarification to Councillor Harris's questions. I'd like to be clear that with the recommended option, the boardwalk is not included. The difference between the recommended and the enhanced option is the boardwalk and steel stairs. Yeah. Just a second. Go ahead. No, I was only asking that question in relation to uh, the, the depth, the ponds, the ability of the ponds to hold water. Um, I, I realize that whether we build a, a boardwalk is is another discussion. So fair, fair enough. enough. But thanks for clarifying that. Okay, so we'll move on to traffic calming implementation. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Project 23002, traffic calming implementation. We'll construct a roundabout at the intersection of West Park Drive and Woodbridge Link. This is a $300,000 project funded by annual capital funding. Um, it's a quartile four project. Speeds and traffic along this section of West Park Drive have been monitored for a number of years. This area has consistently recorded speeds more than five kilometers an hour above the posted speed limit, um, which triggered steps within traffic calming policy. Uh, speeds have consistently been recorded with the, the V85, which is the, the speed that we use for um, identifying issues between 55 and 60 kilometers per hour with maximum speeds over 90 kilometers an hour. A concept was developed in the spring of 2021 to help slow speeds and improve access along this stretch of roadway. The concept included the construction of three roundabouts. 
This concept was presented to the public as part of the traffic safety survey in June of 2021. The concept was supported or somewhat supported by 59% uh, of respondents, with the most common negative comment being that, there, that three roundabouts was too excessive for this stretch of road. Uh, this project will construct one roundabout at the busiest intersection located approximately midway along this length of West Park Drive. The roundabout will slow through traffic along the road, roadway as it maneuvers around the circle and will allow better access from the side streets as vehicles only have to yield to cars already in the circle from their left. Detailed design will be complete this winter with construction in summer 2023. Targeted engagement will take place with the homeowners immediately adjacent to the proposal to understand and address their concerns, uh, any concerns that they may have with the installation. A broader information campaign will be used to advise the wider community of the project. The plan is to construct a second roundabout in 2020, sorry, 2024 on 95A Avenue at West Park Way and then monitor the effectiveness along both roadways prior to bringing forward any additional measures along these stretches happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Councillor Abatoye, you're first. Thank you. Councillor Macon. I'm just curious why um, why the order of was selected. So was West Park Drive's numbers significantly higher? Is that why it was chosen over 95A to go first? Uh, your Worship, the Councillor Macon, it was a it's a higher concerning roadway, yes. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for me for now. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Kelly? No questions. Thank you. I have no questions on this one. Uh, Councillor Harris? I do. Um, yeah, I think both these projects are, are a good idea. And so when you looked at um, the... And I, I think the overall benefit of this is moving traffic through it, not so much speed reduction, but the side street. So the one on West Park or Woodbridge, West Park Drive, that's got a lot of traffic coming off of Woodbridge Link. That's that's big, big time in terms of impact to trying to get across and into that intersection. Is that correct? Uh, Worship of Council Harris, it's Woodbridge Link and Woodsmere Close, actually the other way. So it's too okay. very busy. All right, so, so your analysis looks at the number of uh, households that are in either one of those and how they're getting back into the major, uh, the major arterial, which uh, West Park Drive is, correct? Uh, your Worship Council, so that's part of the analysis, yes, is that traffic volume. Yes. Okay, so there's more population uh, adjacent to this intersection than the one in 95A. That's correct, yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Blizzard. Do we anticipate a lot of traffic in the future in this area? I know it's not quite built out yet um, because I'm just thinking, not that I'm against the uh, traffic circle, but a four-way stop would be considerably cheaper, correct? Um, Your Worship Councillor Blizzard, they, are a, they serve a different purpose, I guess. Um, a four-way stop through the analysis is a really high bar to hit. Um, because you're, it looks at about an eight-hour peak of traffic from all directions that so needs to be relatively um, equal and over a certain threshold. Um, and then they be, if they don't meet those thresholds, what happens is those stops become less effective because you don't expect traffic from the side. You stop, you never expect anybody there, so you, your stop becomes less of a stop and more of a roll until you need to stop because there is somebody there and you've missed them at that point. And hopefully you've missed them and not hit them, but there's that piece of it. Um, so this, with a, with a circle, uh, with the roundabout, it keeps traffic flowing. Um, people are able to have a yield condition and only yielding to their left. Um, once they're in the circle, they have the right of way. Um, and it just keeps traffic moving from all directions. You're on mute. Sorry, thank you for explaining that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan, questions on this one? Yeah, my question just has to do with the public engagement that, that you conducted. There's very close numbers of support to do not support and then a gray area of people that somewhat support. Was this public engagement conducted just on feedback for a traffic circle in particular or was it in, more in general for, tra for traffic calming and the, and the need for that? 
um, Your Worship the Council Noy. And so in this case, it was showing the map where these would be. Okay. So it was these specific circles specific themselves. Specific roundabouts yeah. then. And then what was the feedback that we received from the, the large number of almost 40% of, of people who don't support this? Was it was it the infrastructure of a roundabout or just or were, were there other concerns? I'm just trying to get my head around why so many people were kind of disagreeing with this. Um, Your Worship Council Noy, the, the most common feedback we got on that because the map showed three. It showed um, a, another roundabout north and another roundabout south of this location. And so that was the biggest piece of feedback we got out of the nose was that's too many. Okay. Well, Not so much against the circle, but just the numbers that we were that were in that. Perhaps overwhelming to think of three of them in succession yeah. like that along the same roadway. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So there was very few questions. I'm just going to see if anybody else has any. The item is not flagged, so we will... Looking at the time, 11.15, so we'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Which is the mobile computer-aided dispatch GPS. Good morning, Your Worship and members of Council. Uh, my name is Todd Martins, the Fire Chief here with the City. I'm here today to present the Fire Services 2023 Capital Budget Request, Project Number 23009, Mobile Aid Dispatch with a quartile of four, funding source through annual capital funding for a total of $60,000. In 2023, Fire Services will look to replace all fire apparatus iPad technology with mobile data terminals. This technology allows information from the dispatch center to be sent immediately to the responding apparatus and ensure that first responders receive the critical information they need. Mapping is also pushed directly to the apparatus in live time for mapping, routing, and the apparatus from dispatch. The transition from the iPad to the mobile data terminals ensures that the city fire services is able to use the current technology that supports the ability to respond to incidents gathers information through the GIS mapping, link with our dispatch system, as well as Alberta Health Services dispatch, and access all the information that we need for reporting purposes. Mobile data terminals are the industry standard across North America and was implemented about 35 years ago in the US. The technology has been more recently in the urban, suburban, and rural areas in Canada for the last 20 years. Fire Service and other municipalities in our regions that use this technology, Edmonton, Strathcona, St. Albert, Leduc, Stony Plain, as well as our EMS partners, Alberta Health Services and Medivy. Future operating impacts will be an annual impact of 6,120 starting in 2024 for an ongoing annual transfers to reserve for a future life cycle replacement. Thank you. Okay, so you're ready for any questions? Yes. All right. Thank you. Councillor Macon, you're first. No questions. Councillor Kelly. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I understand the need. Does this equipment provide GPS, pardon me, traffic routing directions to get from the hall to the place of where you're headed, where the fire is or the emergency is? Your Worship, through Councillor Kelly. Yes, so this will be live time right from a push push from dispatch with routing and mapping. And it's based on our mapping system the city has for roads instead of Apple or Google Maps. So and for it to work, will it give voice commands to the driver through the operator or will there a second person occupant need to give verbal commands off of that system to the operator? No, it'll shows up on the on the screen and the officer in the vehicle, not the driver, runs the apparatus and it basically tracks you and calls out like a your regular Apple CarPlay through the system that we're looking at. So it's an audible command that the, our, the driver can also hear it in real time. Hopefully the driver can hear it. <laughs> I hear you. Yes. Okay, thank you. You bet. Thank you. 
So the question I have, this is just strictly the GPS getting from A to B. This isn't the one that will change the lights? That's correct, Your Worship. This is just the, the GPS mapping, so we have the routes to get to our calls, not the preemption system, which I speak to later. So when the trucks were purchased, did they not anticipate uh, having this built into the vehicles at the time of purchase? I, I, Your Worship, I, I cannot speak to that. I wasn't here for that, so I wasn't sure what the thought process was at that time. Okay. Uh, Councillor Harris, questions? So re respecting the fact that our community is not that large, people that are driving emergency response vehicles live and reside or work in the city, correct? So by and large, they know the quickest routes to get from point A to point B. Would they not? Do they really need this kind of, you know, I mean, in a large community, maybe, but here, do we really need it? Here, worship through to Councillor Harris. Yeah, yes, we do need it. Not and a lot of our paid on calls um, that work, um, they're not they're not always working actively in the fire hall based on their other jobs. So uh, sometimes when they're working, um, this is that extra um, addition that they're going to use to get them to where they need to go. Um, for the most part, I think the members know the main streets, but when we start to branch off into some of our residential areas, that's where it adds some concern. Um, we don't have actual mapping now that shows addressing um, into a fine detail on the houses. So this will be able to pull up um, and expand that so we can go to the actual resident. Okay, you just hit the nail on the head for, for the rationale for this equipment. So it's not, not so much the major roads, it's the neighborhoods and site specific. Correct. Application, okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Blizzard. Questions on this one? No, nothing. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Noyan, questions? No, thank you. <clears throat> so I fully appreciate uh, the intent of this. Uh, so we, we have, you know, we have apps like Apple Maps, Google Maps, uh, Waze that, that show you uh, if there's traffic congestion or, or roadway closures, construction, and whatnot. Uh, in certain areas, does, do, does this, the, the software that's integrated with this system, take that into account so it can reroute as well if, if needed? Your Worship, through to Councillor Noy. Yes, so th this this software is just not GPS mapping from from dispatch. That's the major point of this, but we're able to use it for out-of-service hydrants, for construction, road work. Uh, when we have out-of-service roadways, we that would be uploaded in the system. Uh, so it has the ability to do a lot more um, standpipe connections, ga gas fortis connections can all go in there. So it populates on the screen. So it helps us when we're pulling up to whether it's an EMS call or, or to a fire call. It gives us the ability to see those other aspects as well with this technology. Excellent. Yeah. So it's all encompassing software that Correct. allows you to do your job more effectively. Thank you. Councillor Abatoye, questions on this one? Go ahead. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so this um, funds is for the actual equipment and the software. And we know how software changes all the time, right? It's needs for upgrades and all of that. So do we expect you to come back to ask for funds for software upgrades? Or because I, I don't imagine the software is going to remain the same for the next 10 years. Your worship through Councillor Abatoye, we'll review the software needs probably about every five years with this type of technology. Um, with the company we've been looking at, um, that's kind of what they speculated, five, uh, seven to ten is pushing it, but it's about a five-year mark that we're going to... Right, okay, thank you. So 60,000, that's for how many of these equipments? That's for all of our vehicles that uh, we currently have at the department. Uh, it's for ten. Ten, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this item is not flagged, so uh, we will move on, but I'm looking at the time. Uh, it's 11.24, so I'm not going to go on to the next one. You're good. You're good to go. Uh, so I'm not going to go on to the next one right now, so we will take a recess to have lunch at this point in time. We are going to come back at 12 o'clock, though, and then go until 1.30, at which point in time we will go over to the uh, bridge information update. So we are in recess until 12 o'clock.
Okay, the time is、uh, 12 o'clock, so we are going to resume. I can call the meeting back to order, please. We'll call the meeting back to order. So we only have several more,、uh, when, a few more of these items, and then a 2023 2032 capital plan overview. As I indicated, we will break at 1 30 so we can carpool down to the Bridge announcement update、uh, for two o'clock. And depending on where we are, if we can get through the majority of this, Then, then we won't have to return. So just keep that in mind. If we can do all of this within the next hour and a half, if we can't,、uh, we'll determine whether to come back or not. Okay, so we will move right along with the new columbarium. Thank you, Your Worship.、Um, project 23013, new columbarium, which starts on page 227 of your budget binder.、Uh, the This project falls in quartile number four,、uh, with significant score in mandate population serve and cost recovery. It also aligns with the strategic goals of well planned and maintained infrastructures. The city offers cemetery services. Internment options currently available to the Fort Saskatchewan Cemetery include traditional in ground burial, in ground cremation, and columbarium niche. The columbarium niches are becoming an increasingly popular option, with cremation rates steadily raising over the past 30 years. Currently, Fort Saskatchewan Cemetery has five columbarium units that are available to the public, with 52 niches available, and this is as of June 2022. There is an additional two private columbarium units dedicated to the RCMP and the Legion as well,、um, but these ones have capacity. Assuming an absorption rate of about 15 to 20 niches per year, this is what we see in ourselves year after year. So the remaining inventory that we have, 52,、um, is estimated to be absorbed between 2025 2026. So, if we want to continue the service, we need to do something and increase the inventory. So, to proactively ensure this option remains available to the public, two columbarium units are proposed for purchase in 2023. The units will provide 48 niches each, so that will be a total of 96 niches, increasing the city's inventory to about 148 niches. The inventory shall last for the next seven to ten years. This initiative is in line with the 2017 Cemetery Master Plan. The cost of the project is $125,000 for uh, two niches, uh, two columbariums. Operating impact is minimal, about $600 for insurance and maintenance.、Uh, that's per year. And this project is funded through the Perpetual Care Reserve. Uh, the uncommitted balance as of August 2022 is $571.341. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Kelly, you're first on this one. Thank you. What do we charge? How much do we charge for the sale or transfer of one of these individual units, Richard? Uh, Your Worship, I'll need to go back to the exact fees and charges, but I'll give you round numbers. I think the, the upper units,、uh, the first two row at the top,、uh, around、uh, $1,800, close to、uh, 1800, uh, 18 to、uh, $1,900, and the lower one a little bit cheaper, and I will say in the $1,600, $1,700. Close enough, thank you. And what do we charge for a plot in the ground? The cemetery plot, approximately. I have some notes on that. Let me、okay. have a look. Okay. Because along with just the purchase、yeah. becomes a, an obligation of the city to maintain these things in going forward, I think. Yeah, and, and when we look at this, we not only look at the space itself, but also what it takes to open it and close it、okay. and all these things. So if you're looking at the, um, a, um, a four by nine plot, that's a regular plot. Um, the plot purchase is about, again, round number $1,200, round numbers here.、Um, and then we have、uh, to open and close as well 
um, and that may add to up to a thousand dollars into this for the for the work uh, being done. And the person has to have a, a monument foundation as well and everything else. That so overall, if you do a, a typical um, uh, four by nine, um, uh, you're looking at anywhere about two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars. That Perfect. makes sense. So the and the the columbarium when you look at it, just looking at that number here to add to what I said a little bit before. Um, overall, when you factor the open close and and the, the purchasing of the, you're looking at about at, uh, right now between nineteen hundred and twenty two hundred. So it's very comparable. They are aren't they surprisingly so actually. Thank you. We'll talk about it in fees and charges when we get there. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, thank you. I'm next to the speaking order. So the question that I have, so as I'm looking at five of them all clustered there, um, when the master plan was done that to actually integrated these, wasn't there the thought of actually moving them into areas that couldn't be dug for um, for for grave sites so that you could have them spread out? Your Worship, um, the in this case of the the new columbarium we're thinking here the two the two will be and i'm following the cemetery master plan they were these were planned to be added close to the area that we have right now where the five clusters are so there is like a concrete pad and everything else and we can add to this and this is a place to do it there's other things we can do in the future um, I think that the cemetery master plan phase one will come in 2025, 2026, and then there they will. They, they could be some alternative of where we kind of where we want to put them. Um, there's uh, at this time I don't have another location than the one that I, we we describe in the in the in the report. Okay, and I would like to make some comments on that, but um, it it's okay. I'll just leave it. Just questions, yes. Councillor Harris, you're next. I'll hold you to questions. No questions. <laughs> Councillor Blizzard. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions here. Um, it says we have 40 some still used, and I don't have a problem with building more, but at what point do we say we're not going to build until some of the bottom ones are filled up? Uh, your worship to councillor um, Blizzard. When we look when, when we look at the business case here, we look at the total amount of 52 uh, that was available. We know that um, the top two rows um, uh, are more popular than the bottom two rows. So what we're planning to do coming to council um, in uh, November during the operational budget when we're going to discuss the fees and charges is to reduce the cost of the lower um, rows and increase a little bit the cost of the upper rows because they're more popular and providing maybe an opportunity or for people to purchase um, the lower levels uh, at a, a much cheaper rate, which may be very attractive for them as well. So we can basically um, take uh, reduce inventory available and, uh, and move forward. But what, uh, what we're looking at right now in our business case is not really, there's the upper and lower, but there's also the total for which what we plan to see is about 2025 will be uh, fully depleted. Okay. Um, and one more question. Um, how about, I, I looked at the picture of them. I don't have anyone in a niche that I go see them regularly, but um, there are the bottom ones are pretty low to the ground. Is there a way to maybe raise that, have a bigger base, have a, I don't know, some kind of a underneath solid stones and then build up so they're a little higher? Your Worship, to uh, Councillor Blizzard, at this time, what we're looking at is something very similar to what we have currently. Okay. But, I mean, that would be a future consideration, have the bottom ones not quite as low. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan, any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question. We we could feasibly move this project to next year and and and, and not really have a risk of you know an overwhelming demand for these. Um, probably moving it into twenty twenty five is undoable based on the the rolling average here for the last five years. But would you be comfortable doing that, or is this something that, in your opinion, is kind of imminent? 
uh, your worship to Councillor Noyan, if if needed, this can be moved uh, by a year, but I won't go beyond another year, no. because uh, then most likely the inventory will be close to the 15 to 20 left, and that that yeah, is getting tight, getting risky territory. Yeah. And then, how, how long would it take to to complete this project to build two of these? A couple of months, sort of thing, in the summer. Is that? Yeah, in, in 2023, basically by the summer, it should be installed. What will take most of the time is get the, the concrete base hmm. in place and then, but those are readily available. So. Ms. Smith, okay. would you like to weigh in? Thank you, Your Worship. Just to add to what Mr. Gagnon said, um, with the supply chain, ch supply chain challenges we've been having, we feel it's prudent to do this work now. We want to make sure this option is available should our customers wish to uh, pursue this option. Okay, great, thanks. Councillor Abatoye, questions? Thank you, Mr. Gagnon, for your presentation. Um, just two quick questions. Um, so how many of these niches do we get for 125,000? I couldn't really tell because I just saw different numbers, 88, 96, 52. What, what does it get us? How many? So the inventory, the, the, the purchase of the two columbariums, each of them has 48 units. Therefore, you're going to have 96 units okay, with the, additional. With the, with the 125,000, thank which you. Which is about uh, already two times what we have in inventory, about 50, so. Okay, thank you. Um, just my second question. So it seems like we're gonna be, we're gonna fully recover our costs um, considering if everything is sold and how much we're, we're paying. But my question though is about insurance. So we're gonna be paying $600 for insurance and maintenance every year. Um, so is that still perpetuity or how does, how does that work? The uh, the insurance is ongoing for what we have, so uh, and it's pretty low cost. I believe the insurance was quoted about two hundred bucks just to insure these things. So okay. very low and it's ongoing. Okay, but well, it's good to see that it's fully cost recovered. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Macon. Anything? You're good. Okay. All right. So we'll go through round two, uh, Councillor Kelly. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> I'd like to follow up with a couple questions from prior councillors. Uh, Councillor Blizzard talked about perhaps changing the style. Would it be possible to get a quick estimate of what that would entail, Richard, and by next meeting, if I were to flag this? Uh, Your Worship to Council Secretary, if I understand well, you would like to see maybe uh, what kind of other options is available and for, how much? For design, yes. Nobody likes to live in the basement, obviously, so, so maybe we can move it above ground. And, and I don't want a report. I just like some rough estimates as to what we have for style options and what the cost might be. Is that possible? Yeah, it's possible. We can talk to the... Uh, the, the companies that provide quotes, there's not that many that does this type of uh, product, and then we'll see if they can get back to us by for Thursday. Perfect, we'll thank ask. you. Um, That's the best we can do. Before I flag it, I've got one more question. Okay, just before you flag it, though, I guess my question back to you, uh, if they're not able to get that, um, if it goes forward, um, would you be sufficient to say, well, you would like to see the designs before anything's purchased? And or before we approve capital budget in December, perhaps. Yeah, so that could be the other option than flagging it. And and we can do we're that. going to talk about fees and charges, and you brought it up already, Richard, and I thank you for that. Um, I'm not at all convinced we recover our costs. It would be, I would ask you, i give you a heads up now, that I will ask when we get to operating budget, what the in perpetuity cost of maintaining these things are on a discounted cash flow basis so that we can see whether or not we're recovering our costs. Thank you. Okay, okay and that will be for future with fees and Just charges. A heads up, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so anything further on round two, Councillor Harris? You're good. Councillor Blizzard, anything further? Uh, Councillor Noyan, you're good. Councillor Batoye, you're good. Councillor Macon? Good. And Councillor Kelly. So um, if you can't get the information by th Thursday. Let's flag it. Okay. I would ask that it be flagged because that's how we get the information back. If it's not available, we'll deal with it. Okay. So does anybody have any objections to this being flagged for more information? Not seeing any. So that will be the request. Okay. Thank you. 
So we will move on to, I, thank you very much, Richard. So item 23028, IT edition, Trevor Harder. Good afternoon, Your Worship, Council. I'm Trevor, Director of Information Technology. I'll speak. I will be speaking to Capital Plan Request 23028, DCC Security Camera System. There has been information brought forward and shared within the past month in respect to this request that I am not comfortable bringing it forward in 2023 and therefore will be removing it from the 2023 capital budget. It was too late in the budget process to remove from the binder, so I do apologize for your time. The magnitude of this project is much larger than originally anticipated. We need to do an in-depth review of the DCC camera system while including other areas within the city that would potentially benefit as well. It will be brought back in 2024 as a citywide security camera system. This is a first for me, and at this time, I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. I'll just see if there's any questions, but being that it's polled, um, I'm actually first in the speaking order. Um, is there any reason uh, additional that you want to speak to the reason that you're so uncomfortable with it, or would you just like to pass on that? Uh, no, I'd like to speak to it, um, Your Worship. The, the main reason is that the information that we originally got from the vendor for our security, for the security camera system at the Dow Center um, came in late and it lacked a lot of the details that we needed. Um, at the Dow Center, all the cabling and everything is outdated and needs to be replaced. Um, the cameras, there's quite a few more, there's about 40 cameras there or close to 50 cameras. Um, and most of those have to be upgraded and replaced as well. So it was also brought forward by um, um, our managers, um, Ms. Ms. Cowie and um, Ms. Smith, Smith, that uh, we could benefit in other areas, um, providing cameras into some of the spaces in the city. And I thought that would be a good time, or it would be better to pull it and do one one project and bring it forward in 2024 where we can include everything. Okay, thank you. I'll just see if anybody has any further questions. Councillor Harris? Councillor Blizzard? Councillor Noyan? Go ahead. Yeah, j just w one question. That this might be for protective services instead. Mm -hmm. uh, so the 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 request, uh, as it stood before being pulled, was that uh, the DCC camera, the security system in, in, in total, be be reevaluated and potentially upgraded. Uh, have we seen an, an uptake of incidents occurring at the DCC over the past year that uh, that prompted this? It, specifically, I know you're you're yeah. working more towards the bigger picture in the future here. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, I don't, I don't, I can't speak. I actually, I can only go by what I hear, and I do. I have heard that there have been um, increasing incidents. Perhaps somebody else in the administration could speak to that. Ms. Cowley, uh, would you sure? Like through your worship to Councillor Noyan, <clears throat> certainly there have been an increase that we've seen all over the city um, with some incidents and and issues that we're dealing with, um, and through our pilot project of our community peace officer having that presence walk through all of our buildings both indoor and outdoor we've seen a positive impact to that um, and I think we're just trying to as Mr. Harder said if we're going to do something we should make sure that we're looking at it holistically and so the opportunity to look at some of our outdoor spaces as well as our indoor is probably going to serve us well in the long run. Yeah, I would agree okay thank you. Councillor Abatoye any questions you're good Councillor Macon you're good, Councillor Kelly. Okay, no, all right. So thank you very much. That item is pulled, and yep. we'll move on to the next item. Uh, 23029, Smart Intersection System. We have our fire chief, Todd Martin.
Thank you, Your Worship and members of Council. Uh, Fire Service second uh, request for 2023 capital budget um, item, project number 23029, Smart Integrated System, uh, quartile four, uh, funding source from the fire equipment reserves um, for a total of 200,000. The new preemption, preemption traffic control system will look to be installed in 2023 to provide for a more effective and efficient fire services response within the city of Fort Saskatchewan. The system will be installed on the lights on Highway 15 and 21 and run through the whole length of the city, starting at 21 and South Ridge Boulevard and ending at Highway 15 and 88th Ave for a total of seven lights. The equipment will be able to identify the lights, give us priorities and change the route to green. The system utilizes a cloud-based or radio frequency to activate and change the lights to allow the trucks to proceed through the intersection and keep traffic moving consistently. The equipment will help also help to reduce travel time across the city for all of the calls that the fire services does, as well as achieve the standard of the 10 minutes 90% of the time. This level of service or technology is considered the norm in Alberta, as well as the capital region, and our this includes this Edmonton, St. Albert, Spruce Grove, uh, Leduc, Red Deer, and Airdrie, to name a few. Uh, also, the traffic system could possibly be expanded in the future to other departments, should that be an option. Um, future operating impacts and ongoing operating costs will be seen in 2024 uh, for software and subscriptions of $14,000 and ongoing annual reserve contribution for life cycle replacement of 20000 for the total of the 34000 you see on the screen. Uh, with that, uh, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Councillor Harris, you're first. Um, I understand the need for this uh, technology, and uh, I support it. The question I've got is not so much about this, but when, and it's probably to Mr. Schaefer, because they kind of dovetail. When we do this highway widening, are we going to move to uh, uh, kind of a light system that ultimately is more coordinated? Because our, our highway traffic lights are anything but coordinated, and it's a very challenging um, question in any regard. But are we looking at um, like a coordinated light system so people are traveling at a consistent speed would typically be able to hit green lights as opposed to red lights? And then obviously as we introduce this new type of technology, you got an emergency response, you override that in any event. And then ultimately, away you go, you safe movement of your trucks. But are we looking at some sort of an integration of our um, uh, traffic signal timing? Um, Your Worship, Councillor Harris, we're actually working on that project right now. Um, we're expecting this fall to be changing some of the timing on the highway to help improve that coordination. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll say it will not be perfect. Um, the distances between the two lights are too great, and there's too great a variance, but. We're hoping to be able to improve things. Okay, well, then that's fine. So as as you currently exist going to a fire call or whatnot, you just have to follow the rules of the road and only proceed through a red light if it's safe to do so until you get this type of uh, technology. Is that is that correct understanding? Your Worship, through to Councillor Harris. That is correct. Well, even running lights and sirens, we're just asking permission to the public to move over um, and give us the right of way. Uh, yeah. we're, we're still not allowed to really break the traffic safety act. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blizzard, any questions on this one? Yes. Um, so it talks about when eventually snow plows, buses can be added. So when they are, is the way to prioritize that so that the fire department would be moving the lights and if a bus comes that's kind of not done because to me that could be a danger your your worship your worship through to council blizzard should the departments uh, come on board later on absolutely that's how the technology works uh, it is set up based on a priority system and it gives it ranks the vehicles when they're put in and it allow the fire trucks to proceed through before it would a snow plow or, or, or a bus, for example. OK, and then with all the technology that changes year to year, so it kind of looks like we've got a this should last 10 years. Um, is that realistic or are we going to be back in five years because, you know, things move up and get better? Here we're shipped through to Councillor Blizzard. It, that's what we're being told is that seven to 10 mark is, is where we would start 
reviewing again for the newer technology. Okay, thank you. you bet. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan, any questions? You're good, Councillor Abatoye. Go ahead. Um, so we talked about um, the fire, fire service not being able to meet that 10 minutes um, response time. So how much of a delay are we experiencing as a result of the traffic lights and how much are we going to save as a result of this software if implemented? Your Worship, through to Council of Otoy. I don't have the exact time saving costs right now. Um, the municipalities I wrote, reached out to, we were anywhere from about 15 to 25 percent. Um, that the other municipalities see, seen in a time saving based on all of their calls responding to incidents. Um, we have our current data now, uh, and we would once implemented, then we would look at what a six month and what a year would look like for for our, you know, what percentage we were seeing as a, as a savings. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Um, so, do you reckon that this would help us start to meet, to meet that response time in those south areas of the community that we are not able to meet right now? Your Worship, and through to Councillor Abatoya, this will definitely help. Um, I, I can't say definitively it, it will. This will this will help with the HERF um, standard as well as this will also help with all the other calls we go to, uh, whether that's medical, alarms, car fires, and, and so it's more about level of service and providing oh. that across the city. Yeah, but maybe not 100 percent, but it would definitely improve it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Macon. Questions? Thank you. Um, so can you speak to how many sets of lights it would be installed on for the cost? Your Worship, through to Councillor Macon. Right now we're looking at seven lights and, and this is the cost, the 200000 is for the equipment in the vehicles. So it'd be roughly the 10 vehicles, the same as the other project, uh, as well as the equipment that would go into the lights. Um, now, we're not sure what system we're going, whether it's the radio waves or the cloud way yet, but that'll be determined uh, later down the road. Okay. And then how much time would you say right now you're missing the mark on when getting to those calls that are the furthest from you? Your Worship, through Councillor Macon, I, I don't have the exact number um, for calls that we would be missing. Uh, we do have the 10% window through the 1090 that, we're, that we don't meet. Um, you know, this will give us the ability to, to hopefully meet all the calls in, in that south area. But we'll also, um, with the challenges we're currently seeing now, um, time of day, traffic volumes, this will just help us kind of meet our current call volume in and around the rest of the city. Would, oh, I'll come back, I guess. You can have a second one. I think that I has to. Okay, I only had you down for one, but okay. Go ahead, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Uh, the last couple sets of questions, as I listen to them, give me the impression that there's a suggestion that we're having a problem community-wide making our 10% response time to HERF requirements. Is that true, yes or no? Your Worship, through to Councillor Kelly. In some areas, yes. What? I can't say the whole city is not meeting the times, but in some areas, yes. Some areas we're not doing it, or some areas are a challenge? Some is areas it? are a challenge to meet the, 90, the 1090, correct. Gotcha, but that's different than saying we're not doing it. Correct. Um, when we don't meet it, there's other requirements that the city is supposed to undertake. Have we initiated those other requirements, such as notification to the developers? Your Worship, and through to Councillor Kelly, uh, we're we're just kind of in kind of a little bit in the middle of a of few studies that are are coming. Um, so we completed that the station location study uh, recently, as well as we're just in the middle of the master plan, which we spoke to. So that we're hoping that that data um, from those two plans can come back to council for a clear picture of the areas um, that we are having challenges in the city and meeting the times. I'm going to leave it at that, Mayor Catcher. I, I just think there's a difference between having challenges and, and an implication that we're not meeting. And I'd like it to be clear we're having challenges. Is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the question that I have, so you're talking about having this installed. 
and they can access the seven different lights. So the question that I have, if it's installed in the vehicle, what's the policy going to be on, on how it's used? So if the truck is just out driving around and it senses it, would it automatically change it? Or is there a policy that they have to push a button or something so they're not getting priority over traffic just because they're going to get groceries? Your Worship, it's based on um, the activation of the lights. This is the emergency lights and the sirens. So when the, the lights are activated um, and they're within a certain distance of the lights, that's when it triggers the lights to change green to allow the other vehicles to proceed through. Okay. So it, it, it would be activated based on their, their sirens and their lighting systems. Okay. Yes. And I'm sure there will be a policy drafted up that you guys will follow. Correct. Okay, I'm good on my question. So I'll just see if there's any additional need for round two. Just looking at people, not looking like it. All right, thank you very much. We will move on to the next item, 23030 92nd Street tra uh, Trail Conversion. Grant Schaefer, I believe, is presenting. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Project 23020 is 92 Street Trail Conversion. This is a $150,000 project funded by annual capital funding. It will be paid back by developers as development progresses within South Fort. This is a quartile three project. The South Fort ASP identifies 92 Street as a, a greenway trail running north and south through the South Fort neighborhood. The north section of the trail from South Fort Drive to Dillingham Avenue is constructed. The next portion to the south from Dillingham Avenue to Meadowview Drive was closed to traffic in 2021 as development progressed on both sides of the roadway towards the south. The trail conversion ultimately is the responsibility of the adjacent developers to complete and is included within development agreements. Um, on the map on page 37, I'm going to be referring to that a little bit. Um, the trail conversion is the responsibility of the adjacent developers to complete. Um, the developer to the west of 92 Street, which is developer one on the map, is nearing completion of their lands and will be contributing 50% of the constru construction costs for the project. There are two developers on the east side of 92 Street. The northernmost developer, developer two on the map, is active and progressing um, with development and will be contributing 50% of construction costs for portions adjacent to their lands. The southernmost developer on the east side, developer three on the map, is not active in the area and fronts approximately 200 meters of the roadway. This project would have the city front developer three portions to have the trail constructed now, with developer three being required to repay the city when they become active in the adjacent quarter section. If the project is not completed now, the city runs the risk of losing the opportunity to have adjacent developers pay and construct the trail, as the mechanisms may not be in place if they have completed their developments. Alternately, the city could require the active developers to pay their portion based on cost estimates. However, this leaves the city at risk for any cost overruns or inflationary pressures until the project is completed sometime in the future. There is a $2,650 operating impact in parks to maintain this new section of trail. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blizzard, your first questions. Uh, yeah, you know, I always like new trails, so I'm definitely like the idea of this. Um, so if we do this, it's kind of we're fronting the money in a sense. Um, when do we get that? When we get the money back, does it go back? Where does it go to? Um, Your Worship, the Councillor Blizzard, and I may be corrected by somebody in finance when I say this, um, because it's coming from annual capital funding, my assumption would come back into general revenue. Mr. Eman, would you like to confirm that since you're in finance? Uh, three Worship, that Pretty much is correct, yes, because because it is an operating funded type capital project. That's uh, makes sense. That's where it would be returned to. Okay, thank you. Okay. And any idea? I know it's hard to predict, but just roughly when this area is going to be developed? Is that something we see in the next three to five years? Uh, you worship the council blizzard. I'd hate to predict, but I think it would be farther out than that. Okay. You're okay. Good. I think that's all for thank now. You. Okay, Councillor Noyan, any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, just a question on the cost. So $150,000 is would be the city's cost. Like the overall project is 300 with half being with another 150 being put forward through developer levies. Is is that my understanding? Or my understanding correct? Or is it 75,000 of the 150 cost of the whole project? Uh, 
Your Worship, to Councilor Noy, and so the, the 150,000 is the the 50 percent share of the 200 meters, right, at okay. the bottom. So yeah, so it's the whole project is 300. Yep, yeah, that's my that's only right. question. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councilor Abatoy. Questions? No, you're good, Councilor Macon. Councilor Kelly. Uh, yes, thank you. We haven't yet determined whether the traffic calming, in fact, it's just barely been installed, the traffic calming measures on Greenfield Way will be effective or not. Um, do you anticipate that those traffic calming measures will also reduce the traffic flow on Greenfield Way and by how much, Grant? Um, Your Worship, Councillor Kelly, I wouldn't want to put a number around it because that's unknown, um, but I would expect that some of the construction traffic that was going through um, and adjacent neighborhoods will be taking other locations, okay. other directions. Um, I need this flag, Mayor Catcher. I think we're very premature on turning this into a pathway when we haven't yet confirmed that, in fact, we have a solution for the traffic areas in that part of the city. And uh, converting this to a pathway immediately removes any opportunity in the future to reinitiate a street there, if necessary. So flag it, please. Okay, I will ask, is there any objection to flagging it? Councillor Harris, just a second. Objection? Well, I'm not opposed to flagging it, but I think that there are other factors we're going to have to have by way of a discussion because a bunch of the, uh, the uh, linear parkway has already developed. Okay, I just need to know, do you have an objection to well, flagging Well, is that going to be part of the discussion then if we flag this thing? Because, um, you know, ultimately I see developing that is consistent with long-range planning that's been in effect in that area. And I have a couple of questions about, about this thing when we get to it. That might... Okay, well, we'll do a round two, but I'm looking for, are you, do you have an objection to flagging it? Uh, no, if okay. we're going to have a discussion, a fulsome discussion at that point in time. Okay, that's just what I needed to know. Okay, I would probably be opposed, but I think if we want to have a conversation that's fair game, that we uh, uh, can have that conversation. So I'm not seeing any formal objection that we need a vote. Okay. And just let me offer more concerns to administration um, around questions that I might be asking when this comes back. Um, the time frame estimated best guess time frame to get another maybe the extension on Allard and looping around to tie into Highway 21 further south. In other words, how long before we get another egress point, access point, egress point into South Fort Saskatchewan, Southeast Fort Saskatchewan off Highway 21 will be part of my questioning on this time and, and questions around that grant. Okay, so that'll be for Thursday. Okay, you're good. Okay, I'm next in the speaking order. So the question that I want to ask is you just indicated that this is a $300,000 capital project with 50% being funded from the city. So why is this not being listed as 300000 with 150 from the annual capital and 150 from developer levies? Um, Your Worship, in this case, the developers would be building the project and we would just be reimbursing bursting them at the end. So it wouldn't be us hiring the contractors or anything like that. Okay, that's a good response. <laughs> I'm good with that. Okay, uh, Councillor Harris, you're next. So uh, looking at the diagram on 2-40, we've got the section of uh, the project in it, uh, the circle, red circle with 199, correct? Yes, that's right. Okay. So, so that ultimately is the linear parkway, and then south of that, according to your map, it's showing that it, it would eventually, that roadway would eventually be subsumed into the uh, linear trail corridor at a future point, correct? That's correct, yes. So therefore, Meadowview Drive then penetrates across that and into the area that says Developer 3 and Active. So that's, that's, that's ultimately part of the transportation plan is to have cross connections between the neighborhoods, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, good. And further south, do we have that much planning done? I, I can't remember what the area structure plans actually look like. The Your Worship, the Council Harris, so the next connection would be um, South Ridge Boulevard would extend south along, I guess, 
where old city boundary and then tie into 94th Street and potentially further east, depending on that planning. Yeah, so that would be the area that would eventually be developed out below the number 605. Uh, yeah, a little bit, for, yes. Yeah, So and then Southridge Boulevard comes across and then keeps going into the area that Councillor Kelly asked the question about the extension of Allard Way down through that whole development area. And that's a long time in the future, correct? Uh, your worship, Councillor Harris said it looks like it'll be a ways okay. out. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That just that just helps me envision kind of what that's going to look like and the need for this particular project. And I guess the one in that five ninety area that that hasn't been developed as as part of the uh, net, uh, trail, has it? Uh, your worship, Councillor Harris, that hasn't been developed yet, but it's included within this project. That's just paid direct by the developers. Yeah, okay. So that right now is just part of the old old road, which is basically in a cold mix standard, correct? That's correct. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the item is flagged. I'll just see if there's anybody that needs a round two. No, it doesn't look like it. So thank you very much. We can move on to the fleet addition. Richard Gagnon presenting. Thank you, Your Worship. Capital Project 23031, the feed addition of a slope, steep slope uh, remote mower and trailer, which starts on page two dash 42 of your budget package. Uh, the project falls in quartile four uh, with uh, scoring in uh, demand and population serve. It aligns mainly with the strategy goal of a well-planned and maintained infrastructure. The city use, uh, uses ride-on equipment to maintain most of our green space. Ride-on equipment cannot be used in areas where the slope is usually greater than 15 degrees. It's just by the, the, spe the spec of the equipment and uh, the best work practice that is provided to us by those who provide us this equipment. And that includes uh, slopes such as in ditches, uh, drop-off, embankment, and near the edge of uh, some water bodies as well. Um, in these area, as you know, there's some also noxious weeds such as Canadian thistles, and they have thrived um, to limit the environmental impact. The city strives to maximize use of natural control and minimize reliance on chemical controls. Without herbicide, the best strategy for combating thistles is to repeatedly damage the weed as much as we can. In 2023, uh, park services will aggressively maintain thistles patches in highly visible areas, such as on Highway 21 median, uh, ditches between the Dallas and Hill Center and Highway 21, boat launch, as well as the corner of Highway 15 and 101 Street near the golf course. We heard about, about those, those areas being issues and complaints from uh, the residents. Mowing these areas uh, with existing equipment, uh, basically to do these, if they're sloped, then we need to use a line trimmer. Um, could be done basically at a rate of about uh, 0.1 acres per hour. Um, a remote mower operates at a rate of 2.5 acres per hour, so um, it's a little bit more efficient to use these type of uh, equipment to, to do that. So in a sense, our calculation is that a slow mower is 24 times more efficient than a person with a line trimmer to do the job. And if anybody had a chance to go and, and do weeds with a line trimmer, you'll see how painful it is. It's not an easy task. They're long and, um, and uh, they're thick and it takes some time and, and it, it is what it is. So normally, I mean, we can use a, a irrigator tractor to do that, but when you're in the slope, then we need to send people because of the, the legalities of uh, operating these uh, the, the tractors. The cost of the slope mower is $70,000, and that includes a trailer as well. The operating impact is 11500 ongoing, which is uh, 4500 in 2023 and 7000 in 2024, and that's for the transfer to reserve and some maintenance. This uh, project is funded through the annual capital funding tax and then 
I'm available to answer any questions you have. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan, you're first. Do you have any questions? No. Uh, Councillor Abatoye? Councillor Macon? Thank you. Councillor Kelly? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Richard. I understand the need for the mower, but I am highly skeptical, skeptical, I should say, of the thought process. And it's not just yours. I, I did some Googling around this um, about the ability to control this flipping weed by, by mowing it for three years. Um, it doesn't control it in my lawn, and I mow much shorter than, than you guys ever will. So my question is, that's a preamble to get to the question so you understand where the question is coming from. Why don't we selectively take some weed spray and knock this thing out? Uh, your worship to Councillor Kelly, um, I agree there's many different ways of dealing with uh, the Canadian and Thistle, if we want to do that. One, as you, uh, as we mentioned, is to to mow uh, and and uh, uh, and damage it as much as we can that way. Uh, there's also the natural ways. I mean, the GOAT program is one thing. And there's also the chemicals that can be used as well. Right? So what we're trying to do as much as possible is to limit the use of chemicals close to you know, the body of waters. And, uh, and, 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 and that's why we have this approach at this time. I understand uh, when we have many discussions over the last uh, few months because we recognize that this is an issue and we need to address this and we need uh, to officialize a plan on how to basically attack the thistles with all the, the uh, all the technology and and, uh, and all the science that we we can have right we understand that there's now chemicals that are basically more environmentally friendly that can do the work, and we'll look at that as well. So uh, the presentation of the slope more, it's not just about this, or it's about we need to go more something on the slope, and we need to do that safely. So for us, it's another tool in the toolbox to get some work done. Uh, the, uh, addressing the Canadian thistle is, is an, uh, uh, that, that can be part of the solution, uh, but it's not all the solution. There's many other ways. And we'll explore these and we'll make sure next year in 2023 on our website is very clear about what do we do, where do we go, how often, and what's our program to combat the thistle uh, on that side. And there will be, I see three ways. There, there's the chemical ways that we can look at. There is also the aspect of uh, mowing. Uh, or in large areas, I mean, we can maybe look at uh, what farmer used to do and basically uh, uh, contract some if they can help us out with that on very large areas. Um, and there's also the aspect of uh, natural ways uh, through the GOAT program and things like that. So we'll look at all these. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a battle. And, and I would agree. It's, it's a battle, and we're, we, we need to get started on it. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Um, last year, I was skeptical of this type of more. I, I recall a discussion clearly. I spent more time this year, and I watch these things in action on YouTube and they're actually fairly impressive or they can be. So will 70,000 or whatever our budget is, will that get us one that's similar to the photo or will it get us one that has tracks and the ability, some of them have the ability to cut trees or young trees that are up to an inch and a half in diameter and mulch those out in one pass. What kind of equipment will we get for our budget? Uh, you wish you will have to go cost this because right now I believe that what uh, we we looked at in terms of costs is mainly for um, weeds and grass and, and things like that. But if you want something that is is uh, heavier in terms of uh, functions and do small trees, then we'll just make sure that we get another quote for that and again we, we can bring it back. And I'm not stating a preference. I think tracks would be better than wheels. After after yeah. that, I'll leave it to, to to you guys to figure out. Just curious on what we were going to get for our money, what 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 type of quality of machine we would get. Um, thank you. I'm I'm done, Marquette. Okay. okay, thank you. So I'm next on the list. So I was at the demo last last time, and the words that I heard was, "This is primarily a requirement now due to occupational health and safety because we can't ha have 
um, people out there on the mowers and uh, there's area so there's some areas that we're currently not getting done is that correct that's correct okay to both of those yes okay I'm good on that thank you Councillor Harris anything yeah I guess the way I see this um, is there's two issues here there's the purchase of the equipment to do the steep stuff um, the more pressing thing, as far as I'm concerned, is the need for a really concise response to thistle. And I do not believe that our Parks Department has got that in hand. Because the best way to kill thistle, as I've been led to believe, is to kill it before it flowers, probably at the end of May, the beginning of June. And stop it from flowering. So, and then cutting it is, is just a maintenance issue. So, uh, I'm not sure how... I, I really want to see more information on our program to deal with noxious weeds in a general term, and thistle in particular. Um, and I can support this thing, but I'm just saying, how do we deal with, how, is, how can administration, do I have to flag the thing? The administration comes back with a, a comprehensive response to how you're going to manage uh, noxious weeds, and in particular thistle. Because you're, you're talking about you. using this machine to mow yeah. thistle, and yeah. I don't see that. Okay. You worship the Councillor Harris. Again, this is just uh, another piece of equipment that can be used to do that on slopes, right? So that's, but the, the thistle is not just related to slope, it's everywhere, right? Okay. So, I guess so what, what we need is a comprehensive plan. And we, we, we do have a, a few things that we apply right now, but uh, we have not shared that. Uh, I will say with the public, we have not also adapted it to some of the new products that are now available to us as of this year or next year. So what we'd like to do is in the, the first quarter of 2023 is to provide you with maybe some information, maybe through a call meeting where we can uh, provide you with, here's our plan on how we're going to battle thistles in 2023. Well, then, if that's the response, you're going to respond to us with a more definitive statement as to how you're going to deal with it, and we can expect that in due course, then I won't flag this item. Thank okay. you. Okay, so I think you're just pre-warned that when you come to the operating budget, when we start discussing the operating budget, that question will be coming forward. I think that's the prelude to it, because you're basically yeah. asking that now, which is outside of this, but... So that's just just an information one that, that you'll be asking that question during operating. Couldn't have said that better myself. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Blizzard, any questions on this? Uh, yeah, um, I saw this one demonstrated and was quite impressed, actually. I was happy that I was there to see it in action. Um, well, first question, though, I, I don't even know. What's a line trimmer? It's a whipper snipper. Oh, that's all it is? Okay. <laughs> Fancy name, sorry. Um, we expect this then to last about 10 years? That's right. 10 years. Okay. And then this is going to slow down the need for new stuff, but you actually said we're not even trimming the slopes. So are we going to need more staff for this, or does this current staff can, can handle this? No current staff can handle this, and then what it allows us is if we, we, we see areas that we can use this machine instead of line trimmers, then we can reallocate the, the summer staff to other function than uh, spending time in weeds with the line trimmers. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're good. So there wasn't a ton of questions. I'll just see if there is a need for round two. If not, it's not flagged. So thank you very much, Richard and Grant. So we will move on to item number 7, 2023-2032 Capital Plan Overview. And uh, Jeremy will be presenting the overview. Thank you, Your Worship. So yes, so I will now present an overview of the proposed 2023-2032 Capital Plan. Information on the 10-year capital plan is located in Section 3 of the Capital Budget Document. And there you will find two versions of the plan, a fully updated version starting on page 3-1. This version includes forecasts of planned capital funding sources along with planned impacts to operations, property taxes, and debt usage. And a track changes version starting on page 3-4 
which highlights changes to the plan in red that have been made since, since Council's last review in June of this year. And just a reminder, at the end of my presentation, Council may ask administration clarifying questions and or flag items for later discussion. And each of the directors responsible for capital projects in the 10-year capital plan are available to assist. The 2023-2032 capital plan is a flexible multi-year planning tool that the city uses to plan for and track its investment in capital assets. It includes approximately $285 million in total plan project spending and corresponding funding for city projects over the entire 10-year period. In addition, there are approximately $34 million in developer levy funded projects which have been identified separately. The 10-year capital plan incorporates the goals and initiatives of the strategic plan, as well as other multi-year plans and studies which are cross-referenced in notes provided within the document. The plan has been prepared in accordance with the Municipal Government Act, which requires Council to review and update the plan on an annual basis, along with the City's recently updated Operating and Capital Budgets Policy. As I mentioned in my earlier presentation, Council is scheduled to perform another review of the 10-year capital plan along with updates in June of next year prior to its adoption. All capital projects within the 10-year capital plan, excluding developer levy projects, have been prioritized using priority-based budgeting tools. Under PBB, capital projects are prioritized by scoring them against the City's desired results and attributes. This chart on the screen shows the total proposed spending under the 10-year capital plan by PBB quartiles. Again, Q1 and Q2 projects align most closely to the city's established priorities and desired results, while Q3 and Q4 projects align the least. Based on the chart, $80 million, or approximately 30% of the total, is planned to be spent on Q1 and Q2 projects. And as a reminder, the PBB model provides useful data and analysis for decision making, but it is important to consider other factors as well. And Mr. Fleming talked about this in his opening remarks this morning, but it's worth mentioning again. The 2023-2032 capital plan is impacted by a number of plans and studies, which are currently ongoing and will help to inform certain projects within the plan. Recommendations coming out of these plans and studies could impact the timing, scope and or costing of these projects. The studies include the fire master plan, the secondary wa alternative water source, the indoor rec infrastructure service level review, materials handling site and the neighborhood rehabilitation study. As these plans are completed, updates will be made to the 10-year capital plan as applicable for council's subsequent review next June. Again, I would like to draw attention to the one capital project within the 10-year capital plan that will be coming back to Council in 2023 for approval, and that is the Jubilee Recreation Centre modernization. It received Phase 1 design approval by Council during the 2022 capital budget meetings. Construction at the JRC is planned to begin in early 2023 with an estimated completion in 2024. In accordance with the Operating and Capital Budgets Policy, before construction begins, Council will review and approve Phase 2 of the project based on various options and cost refinements established during the design phase. The 10-year capital plan breaks down into five major asset categories, as shown. The majority at 49% represent engineering structures, followed by 30% for buildings, 10% for developer levy projects, 8% for vehicles, machinery, and equipment, and 3% for land improvements. So next I'll highlight some key capital projects planned for within each of the major asset categories covering the entire 10-year period. Engineering structures, the largest category, includes $155.5 million in total projected costs. Significant projects include ongoing annual programs for neighborhood and local road rehabilitation, which together total almost $88 million, or about 60% of the total costs in this category. The secondary alternative water source project seeks a, sorry, seeks a secondary fee to the West Park Reservoir at a projected cost of $24.5 million, with design starting in 2024 and completion in 2026. Veterans Way Corridor Widening is a five-year project slated to begin in 2023 if approved starting with construction of Phase 1, with remaining phases completed from 2029 to 2032. The total projected cost is 2020, sorry, $22.8 million. 
The north and south pedestrian crossings on Veterans Way have a combined cost of $9.7 million. If approved, construction on the north crossing will begin in 2023 at a cost of $3.6 million, with design work on the south crossing to be done in 2030, with construction to begin the following year. Vehicles, machinery, and equipment include total plan expenditures of $26 million. The annual fleet and equipment life cycle replacement is the largest project within this category at $13.2 million. Over the next 10 years, various vehicles, machinery, and equipment are expected to be replaced based on their respective life cycles across the entire city, including fleet facilities and engineering, fire services, IT, culture, and recreation. The total projected costs for buildings are $94.7 million. Major projects in this category include the planning and construction of various facilities related to aquatics, new fire station, arena, as well as the JRC modernization. Again, to remind everyone, the ongoing fire master plan and the indoor recreation infrastructure service level review could impact planned capital projects within the fire services and culture recreation departments. The 10 year capital plan also includes 9.2 million in projected total costs for land and land improvements. Major projects include phases one and two of Fort Center Park, along with the cemetery master plan area one, phase one. Developer levy projects consist of new construction and infrastructure located within the city's growth areas. These projects are fully funded through developer levies, which is why they're presented separately from city projects within the 10 year capital plan. Total projected costs of approximately 34 million include various work to intersections, roadways, sanitary and drainage systems within city limits. New for this year, the 10-year capital plan includes a horizon list prepared by administration and is shown on page 3-6 of the capital budget document. The list is a requirement of the recently updated operating and capital budgets policy and includes capital projects not currently within the capital plan for reasons including there may be no capital funding source and or an insufficiently refined scope, cost, or business case. Currently, there are 16 capital projects on the list with a few notable items, including the Harbor Pool repurposed demolition, public works operational sites, materials handling site, intersection interchange and industrial bypass, and community facility and trails located at West River's Edge. In accordance with the budget policy, the horizon list is to be reviewed by council to determine whether capital projects listed should remain on the list, be removed, or moved for inclusion within the 10-year capital plan. Also, the updated operating and capital budgets policy requires that when a, the scheduled commencement of a major capital project within the proposed capital plan moves from years 6 through 10 inclusive to years 1 through 5 inclusive, that the project be identified for further review by council and by virtue of rolling the 10-year capital plan forward one year, one project moves into the initial five-year time frame and that is the Fort Center Park Phase 2 project which is a five-year project scheduled to begin design work in 2027. The next three slides highlight some key financial impacts related to the 10-year capital plan starting with a breakdown of total planned funding sources so moving from the left to right, grant funding makes up 12% of the total proposed funding. This includes the MSI capital grant, which is scheduled to end in 2023 and is to be replaced with the local government fiscal framework grant in 2024. Based on information provided by the province, the average province-wide funding level under the LGFF will be total 722 million per year, which represents a 25% reduction in funding compared to 2020's level. The Canada Community Building Fund grant is also included in this category. Future capital grants have been estimated based on current funding levels and the most current information that is available. Next, municipal reserves make up 26% of total funding. The city's municipal reserves are established and maintained under the financial reserves policy. Reserves provide the most flexible source of funding for capital projects and are appropriate for funding the life cycle maintenance and replacement of infrastructure and equipment along with supportive funding for major construction projects. Annual capital funding accounts for 15% of total funding and is used primarily to fund ongoing annual capital projects such as local road and neighborhood rehab. Debenture borrowing at 36% is the primary funding source for major construction projects that provide long-term benefits to the community. 
This includes the planned construction of new facilities, secondary water source, and the expansion of the Veterans Way corridor. Debt usage will be covered in more detail on the next slide. <coughs> Developer levy reserves account for 10% and include externally restricted funds to be used for developer levy projects only. And lastly, the remaining 1% comes from trade-in values and proceeds on disposal. This graph shows the future impacts of the 10-year capital plan on the city's debt usage. Planning for the city's debt has been impacted by the Government of Alberta's decision in December 2021 to discontinue below market rate loans to local authorities and instead begin charging at market rates. As a result, the lending rates incorporated into the 10-year capital plan have increased by approximately 0.5 to 0.75% as a result of the province's decision. In addition, these interest rates have also been impacted by increases to the Bank of Canada's overnight rate, which has amounted to 3% since the start of the year. So back to the graph, the blue and yellow lines represent the anticipated percentage of debt limits and debt servicing limits used, respectively. The graph shows slight increases in debt usage beginning in 2023 and continuing through 2025, and then larger increases occurring in 2026 and 27, corresponding to several major construction projects that are proposed to begin. After 2027, the debt usage begins to decline and stabilize as projects are completed, new projects are undertaken, and the debt is repaid over time. The green line represents the city's internal debt limits established by the city's debt management policy, which are set at 75% of the provincially regulated limits. As the chart indicates, the city's anticipated debt servicing and usage levels remain below the internal limits throughout the 10-year capital plan. This final graph shows the forecast ending balances in the city's capital re reserves for each year of the 10-year capital plan. Again, capital reserves are established and managed in accordance with the financial reserves policy. The forecast includes planned contributions to the reserves, planned reserve drawdowns to fund proposed capital projects, and planned transfers to and from operations. On an overall basis, the capital projects and infrastructure lifecycle reserves show gradual increases throughout the, or through, over the 10-year period, while the balances in the utilities infrastructure reserve are fairly consistent throughout. Further updates and information on the city's financial reserves will be provided during the 2023 operating budget presentations. And this concludes my overview of the 10-year capital plan. At this point, Council may ask administration clarifying questions and again, directors for the capital projects are here to assist. Okay, so just uh, process wise, so uh, time is one oh seven. so we're going to uh, break at one thirty so that we can go uh, to uh, to the bridge announcement thing. Um, so I guess the question that I have is, if we go through these some of the questions, we'll come back on Thursday and pick up if there's uh, outstanding questions. We only have 23 minutes. Through your worship, yes. We would just continue on day two. Okay. Okay. So that's kind of where we're at. So we'll, uh, two questions each. We'll try and keep uh, answers as concise as possible, um, knowing that we are going to take a hard break at uh, one thirty, and we will pick back up on Thursday as a first item. Uh, Councillor Abatoye, do you have questions? Thank you again, Mr. Eman, for your presentation. Um, my first question is around funding sources. Um, you have an assumption here um, for the property tax revenue increase. And my question is, does, does the numbers you have there, does that include all of our operating budgets? Or does it just include of, um, the impacts from capital projects? Uh, through your worship, I'm going to pass that to Ms. Andruko to answer. Okay. Right now, this just includes the operating impacts. From capital, okay, thank you. Um, my second question is just again back to the funding sources. It seems like this, um, the ten-year capital plan is debt heavy, and I can understand. But aren't there other grant opportunities we can apply for that we may um, qualify for outside of the LGFF and CCBF? Um, we did take a look at that. Um, there may be one or two, um, but further work would have to be done to research them. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Macon. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't 
what I would like to ask administration to provide is on an annual basis for the 10 year plan, an actual cash flow impact. Um, where I'm struggling, I can see you, you've indicated the, the operating um, impact, but I don't know where on here from a cash flow perspective, the new principal payments on the annual or the increases in our debt will be reported for instance. So, so those have to come from property taxes in my mind. So it, uh, um, I'll pause. You look like you have a response, Shannon. Yeah. So um, we do have those numbers and they'll be incorporated in the operating budget. Um, we could provide something within the document that provides that information or do you? So the operating impact on the 10 year plan yeah. in front of us. Would it, the operating impact would presumably include an estimate for interest on the new debentures? Correct. Does it also include a principal portion on the debt repayment? Correct. It does? Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, one last question and then come back to me, please. The operating impacts, both dollar value and percentage value given those aren't cumulative, obviously. That's the impact for that year's decisions only when you give those numbers in the column. That's right. Sorry, one quick question then. If I add up the operating impacts, dollar value, at the end of 10 years you're proposing, or this plan proposes $40 million per year in additional operating impacts, is that, right? is that correct? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but if you did the math, probably yes. It is, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So the question that I have as I look at this document. Okay, so we're approving one year at a time. Uh, so now when I look at this document, these are your best estimates of where these are going, like these projects? To your worship, um, the one-year capital budget um, would fix the uh, budget for the next 12 months. You're asking beyond that, are they best estimates? Yeah. Uh, to your worship, I would say yes, they are our best estimates based on the information that we have currently available, okay. both in terms of costing these projects. These are um, obviously the lowest um, class of cost estimates at this point for the refinement would have to be done closer to, but um, yes, the simple answer to your question is yes. Okay, so best estimate. So I guess my question comes into some of these projects. You've got uh, traffic lights, 108th Street and 99th Avenue in 2024 at 300,000. And then, and then you have some um, uh, $4 million in 2024 if council decides to do something with the pool. But I guess the question that I have on that is we were told that we would get a response back on the study for the pool by like spring so that council could make a decision. So what, what are you going to do if all of a sudden council says, yeah, we want to move forward with that, but not in 24 with a build in 26? So... What's, what's the plan for that? Uh, through worship, perhaps Mr. Fleming would like to speak to that. Uh, through your worship, if there is a plan that comes back in the spring, um, council would have the ability at that time if they want to move forward and, and take any sort of action from it, so. Okay, so then, so then if there is, then we can move stuff around then. Uh, as we're having the discussion about where we think some of these things should be? Well, through your worship, ideally, I mean, right now is the time, if council knows that it wants to make a change, I would recommend considering that on Thursday. But as you mentioned, there's a lot of things on this list that are have um, studies and plans being being developed for them. And so you might want to make changes, make those changes when that information comes back. Um, in some of those cases. Okay. Um, so I'll have more questions in round two, but going back to the first one on 108th and 99th, why would you consider that a priority in 2024 when that intersection is working sufficiently as a four-way stop? Um, Your Worship, that's a project that's kind of 
Uh, we've left it kind of a, always at a three-year horizon. Um, when the original mall real development came forward, there's a traffic impact assessment done that said when they got to a certain density, lights would be required. Um, and as part of that, the developer actually contributed to that project. So we're keeping it out a couple of years in case that develop that trigger happens. Okay. All right. So I guess uh, now I'm just process wise, because I know there's going to be questions and potentially moving of, of items and things. Do you want just the entire document flagged or do you just want individual items flagged? That's the question. Um, do you worship I think if there's going to be debate on Thursday, it would be in everyone's best interest for us to understand what uh, what's coming forward. Like we can assume the document is flagged, but the feedback from council now would be helpful to prepare everyone, including council, for what debates might come on Thursday. Okay, so if nobody has any objection, we'll make the assumption this is flagged, and then we can have debate on on any of the items. But if there's something specific that you would like more questions, clarification for debate, then uh, let's go down that road. Councillor Harris, you're next. I guess it may, it might give rise to a future capital project that's not on this list. But uh, Mr. Fleming, you and I have had a conversation about uh, potential study for a capital project, small capital project. How, how would you suggest uh, I introduce that into the equation that might ultimately give rise to capital project that might be added to this list? Yeah, through your worship, I think the discussion about the stairs before um, – we had talked about perhaps adding in some money into the operating budget to do a bit of work on getting cost estimates and whatnot done yeah. and taking a little bit of a look at the geotechnical. So I think that could be something um, I can work with you to get some wording for resolution to deal with in November when yeah. we do the operating. Yeah, just, just for edification for council, what I'm looking at is a potential capital project to put stairs, metal stairs, in the very steep slope uh, from the lift station in West Park down to the uh, to the valley floor with the trail, and so I, I'm just looking for direction. So if that's if that's how you suggest to be handled, Mr. Fleming, then I'm good with that, and we can bring it forward in due course. So it's my understanding, Mr. Dance, Mr. Eamon, that uh, if there is something that is out of scope of this, they would do a notice of motion. Yes, through your worship, I, I think that particular item can be dealt with through the operating budget. But if a member of council wishes to debate a matter that really wasn't specifically flagged through the presentations, then we would recommend a notice of motion. If you want it for Thursday, a notice of motion today would be um, recommended. And that's simply just to be consistent with the idea that we're going to try to have no surprises. And we've that's been discussed before with council. Go ahead, you still. Oh. So the example of that is if I really had heart heartache with Yarborough's truck, we would, and I don't, I'm just using that as an example. It's on the list for a period of time. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, that would, that would be a good example. Anything that had a specific plan request that was specifically presented and discussed with questions, I would say that's fine to just debate on Thursday. Anything that, in using our judgment, is sort of outside the scope of anything that's been discussed, we would just recommend a notice of motion. And that's, okay. again, just to avoid the surprise element. Okay. So, and at this point in time, you're saying that one has been discussed and... The River Valley one that he yeah. was... Uh, he just he had shared an email with all of council and myself, and well, I think... And I'm trying to get to the process. Do you want a notice of motion or can you handle it? That one, I think I, I think I will work with him on a notice of motion, but it doesn't need to be for today. That can okay. be for the operating That's budget. all I need to know. Yeah. Okay. All right. Councillor Blizzard, questions? No questions, no notice of motion, and nothing to flag. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Noyan?
Yeah, just in re regards to ten-year capital plan. So we saw we saw the, the graph uh, of the potential debt service ratio. Uh, yeah, in in the future, as it pertains to to what's included in in future capital projects, um, the the threshold that we've established is seventy-five percent as a maximum benchmark for um, for debt. Um, I forget my question. <laughs> just talking myself through that. <laughs> Where was I going? Yeah, uh, I, I guess. Yeah, sorry. Is is that typical of of municipal or in municipal finance to to observe you know a higher like a higher or an exponential curve perhaps in in you know the the, the five year uh, you know five year lookout from present to to, to show that th this is everything that's going to be considered in, in the future as projects. So you know current government and also administration is aware of of you know upcoming needs of a city and then uh, you know and then for council. To, to check in and, and, and make sure every one of these projects is reevaluated you know, as, as they're coming up is so like are, are those numbers fairly typical of municipal finance uh, three worship to councillor Noyan. so I think I think the the really short answer to that particular graph is that it does we do follow our debt management policy that we make sure that in anything that we plan for for capital planning beyond the 10 year beyond the initial year to the 10 year period that it meets that policy and in this case it does it does um, it is well below the 75 percent limit it does increase obviously based on the planned construction throughout that period but uh, we want to make sure that it's maintained below the the threshold of the policy and, and it does Okay. Yeah. Excellent. And I think my my simple question would have just been, are we are we looking forward to t too many projects in in the you know the five to ten year period? But but you've answered that here. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So I'll just check on round two, Councillor Abatoye. Anything further, Councillor Macon, Councillor Kelly. Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. Would it be possible? The 10 year capital plan, the last section on our information is titled funding sources. Would it be possible for administration to provide by Thursday or for Thursday's meeting, hopefully before that, just that section alone, adding, I'm going to propose three additional rows. Um, you give the annual incremental standalone costs for capital and for operating, but there's no cumulative running total for the compounded impact as we move forward to the 10 year plan. So I'd like a compounded role, a role giving the compounded spend to date for capital, spend to date, in other words, annual incremental compounded for operating impact, and then a third role just for the total of the two to help put this stuff in perspective. Because I think when we get to that point and we look at those numbers, we'll find that they're rather staggering. Just to uh, clarify that, so the spend total to date, the operating impact to date, and then the sum of those two? For, correct. For, for each year, in, for each column, yep. a running total that, that, okay. that builds it forward. So that at the end of 10 years, we can see what we've committed to for a total operating spend right. and a capital spend. Makes sense. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, you're good. Okay, so the other question that uh, I have, so we'll consider the entire thing flagged. Going out and finding out what grant funding that we potentially can get from the provincial government. If a plan is part of an IRTMP project, I would anticipate there should be some provincial funding. Otherwise, there's no point in having it uh, on, on the provincial plan. So that's, I think, very important for us to know. All right. And, uh, and I guess that would go for any of the other grant funds that, that are potentially available. But um, I don't have any motions on these, but I will have some more comments on Thursday. Uh, Councillor Harris, anything further for today? Nothing. Councillor Blizzard, you're good. Councillor Noyan? Okay. Is it possible to go back and, and flag an item that was discussed earlier this morning? Absolutely. Okay. You can request it. I would like I would like to request uh, flagging a project nineteen zero two seven, which is the uh, I forget the exact na name of it here. Sorry, scrolling. I think it was fleet uh, replacement. Hmm. 
Yes, f thank you. Thank you, Councilor Harris. Yeah, fleet, fleet and equipment uh, replacement. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to flag it for the reasons of, of giving administration an opportunity to come back with some more information uh, for Council. I'd, I'd like to have a look at the three larger pieces of, of equipment, uh, back the loader, uh, loader and, a, and a street sweeper and have an analysis. I know I, I asked this about, uh, about this already, but uh, I'd like to see further breakdown of, of maintenance costs, uh, parts and, and service for this past year on these three pieces of equipment, as well as the current trade-in value or the buyback value that was, that was mentioned. Um, I had a chance to think about this uh, over lunch a bit, and, and I think some more information would be, uh, would be great to receive on our part. Um, any other information that, that you'd like to provide, uh, you know, proving that at this point in time it's more economical uh, to purchase newer equip or new equipment uh, than to to replace uh, uh, sorry to buy newer equipment and 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 replace the existing rather than keep and and service uh, our existing equipment okay so councillor uh, Noyan is requesting more information on the equipment uh, does anybody have any objections with that being flagged not seeing any that one uh, can be flagged and brought back with some of the answers to some of his questions. Mr. Fleming? Yeah, thank you, Worship. It's probably just because I don't type fast enough here. That was the loader, the street sweeper. Was there a third piece of equipment there? The backhoe loader, yes. Yeah. So those are the three largest components. The backhoe that, loader. That request, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Dance, do you want to sum up uh, uh, what's flagged and uh, how we go forward on Thursday? Thanks, Your Worship. Um, yep, we have uh, seven, that was the seventh flagged item. So we have seven flags coming back, including the 10-year capital plan in general. And then there's two questions that were follow up. So we will endeavor to work on some of those um, to get as as soon as responses back as possible. So Thursday is, is just a couple days away, but we'll do our best. Also, just a, a point of, to reinforce, and both Mr. Fleming and Mr. Eamon had mentioned it, we will look at the 10 year capital plan in detail again in June, as we have done in prior years. There's, I think there's five or six studies that uh, will be coming in the early part, early to mid part of 2023 that will further inform the 10 year capital plan. So council will have a further look in June um, in earnest at that plan. So we return on Thursday morning at, at nine o'clock. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you to everybody for uh, fairly concise uh, questions and answers. So with that, I will adjourn the meeting at 1.27. Um, we are welcome for anybody who wants to carpool. We can carpool across the river. Uh, they, that is for 2 o'clock. So um, it's not mandatory, but you are everybody is welcome to attend. We are adjourned. Thank you. Take care, Councillor Blizzard. <laughs>